This story is about this virgin loser who became the world's greatest assassin. He dedicated his life to work in the shadows just to help his older brother achieve peace. But unexpectedly, he was betrayed. He was charged for treason just because his brother became afraid of the power that he could wield. Long story short, he died. Fortunately, he regressed back when he was still a kid. And now, he was about to dedicate his life for revenge. If this got your interest, watch the whole video. The title of the manhwa is The Regressed Son of the Duke is an Assassin. The story opens when the protagonist talks about what his father always says, which was, live for the clan. He remembered this while they were in the middle of a battlefield. It meant that he should not desire for anything and that he should just stay by his brother's side like a shadow. He was sitting on his knees while blood dripped down his face. Several knights watched him while one person commented how he, a single knight, fights off the continent's strongest commanders on his own. The battlefield was surrounded by fallen knights, but a commander and several knights who can still fight surround him. The commander of the enemy called him by his name, Sian Vert. In response, he uttered the commander's name, Boris. Boris had a smug look on his face. Out of thin air, Sian drew out his sword. He then asked Boris who made him do this to him, and an ominous aura surrounds his body. He asked Boris if it was the emperor. Boris covered his face with his arm. He commented that Cyan's black fog is sickening. Upon witnessing this power, he had confirmed that it was like what the rumors had said. Cyan's aura grew powerful while Boris called him an assassin from Mist. Mist is an organization that is like fog to the Knights of Light. Boris planned to report to the higher-ups that he got rid of an impure being that was affiliated with the heathens. Cyan replied that he should do that when he actually had the mouth left to function after their battle. He threatened Boris that he won't even have a single tooth after he's done with him. Boris advised Cyan that if he plans to use his secret power, he should give up. He told Cyan that there is a ninth star magic barrier casted around the area. In his mind, Cyan knew that he needed to get out of there and reveal the culprit behind it to his brother. With fierce eyes, Cyan declared that he'll just pierce through the barrier. All of a sudden, Cyan was commanded to stop by someone. A reputable man in golden armor arrived. Cyan was surprised and confused to see this familiar person. He recalled what his father always used to say, live for the clan. In addition, his father told him that his brother Ashel is by extension of the clan. Ashel Vert's success is Cyan Vert's success. This man in golden armor has blonde hair and is staring at Cyan. Cyan realized the culprit behind all of it. It was Ashkel. This revelation made his legs weak. Ashel commented that Cyan is confused now that he has appeared. Cyan looked at him. He asked Ashel about the meaning of all of it. Ashel expressed how Cyan carried out his duties well for the clan, for the people, and for him. And upon hearing this statement, our MC knew what was going to happen next. Ashel added that he was just trying to take the burden off his brother's shoulder. Cian admitted that he doesn't understand it. He inquired if he had done anything wrong. Wrong? Ashel asked. Ashel pointed out the ominous fog that Cyan is emitting. He described Cyan as nothing more than a murderer. He's even unsure if his brother can still be called human. Ashel raised his voice when he told Cyan that he fooled them all for a long time. With a hint of anger, he asked Cyan, Can you really say that you don't know your sins? The word murderer and sin echoes in Cyan's head. This made him furious as he wondered what the hell was Ashel was talking about. The succession fight within the Empire, the Demon King Army's raid, the war to unify the continent. Cyan helped Ashel through all of that. All because for Cian, serving his brother is his life. He punched the ground in anger. Our MC slowly stood up. He thought about how Ashel is now abandoning him. Dark aura was now oozing from his body. Driven by his rage, his fog became more intense as he thought about how he worked like a dog under Ashel for 20 years. Blood started pooling at his feet, but he didn't care if his whole body broke down. 
he decided to give everything he has right now, even if it means he can destroy Ashel. His crimson-red mist covered the whole area, painting the sky red. The knights were shocked to see that he still had that much mana left. It was impossible for a human. Sian narrated that the hero is trying to kill his younger brother just because he's afraid. He asked Ashel if he's not ashamed of himself. This made Ashel furious. The veins on his face became visible because of that. Sian launched at him. With incredible speed, he continuously attacked Ashel, who tried to deflect using a sword. Sian wished for one chance. Just once was enough. Their fight continues. One chance is all he needs to stab Ashel's weak point to stop him from regenerating. Sion's attack met a magic barrier. Our MC did not expect for his strongest attack to be blocked by something like this. He checked and saw that Boris helped Ashel. Ashel called him a poor bastard. And he stabbed Sion in the stomach. That made Sion drop his dagger. Ashel told him that he wanted to do the favor of giving him a painless death since he's his brother. But Sion showed him his true colors. He revealed that he knew Sion was a demon from the start. He added how it's a good thing he never trusted Sion to begin with. Sion's expression revealed how heartbroken he was because of that statement. Ashel kicked him so that he could remove the sword from Sion's body. And just like that, he left Sion lying on the ground. Sion's blood pooled underneath him. This scene looked like Sung Jin Wu from Solo Leveling. He wondered if that was his end. He commented on how foolish the life he had lived. As he slowly starts to lose his consciousness, he calls himself stupid. Yet all of a sudden, he chased after Ashel's back. Ashel sensed him and turned. Sion was about to hit him. Sion let out a loud scream as he released all his remaining power for that attack. His dagger was inches away from Ashel's throat, but he was interrupted with a powerful force that blew him away. He lost consciousness. Then he heard somebody calling him Young Master Sion. He immediately woke up. He was sweating profusely and was catching his breath. The maid scolded him for sleeping in. She told him to get his act together since he needs to get ready. He was surprised to see Emily. He asked her what she was doing there. Emily was also surprised. And then he realized something. It has been 20 years since he last saw her, and yet she's the same as she was when he last saw her. He noticed the surroundings. He remembered that it was the room he used to live in when he was younger. Even the furniture arrangement was the same and he thought that maybe he went back to being a child. Emily called him to get his attention. She asked him if he was stalling for time because he doesn't want to go for training. She instructed him to make up his mind and get going. The young Cyan had no idea what Emily talked about. He asked it what training she pertained to. In the Vert Clan Duchy. Cyan looked around and he was certain that he was back in the Duchy of the past. He wondered if the situation is what they call the life flashing before your eyes just before your death. He remembered 27 years ago. It was during the foundation year 985, March 1st. It was a year before he entered the academy. Every year, the duchy holds a dual training session. His father, who is the owner of the duchy, Duke Vert, attends the event, making it a very big deal. His opponent is Kranz Vert. He is the same age as Cyan. He is his half-brother, Kranz's mother, Margaret Ezret, is the Duke's wife. Thanks to that, Kranz received a lot more attention despite the fact that they were both the youngest. Cyan was considered a bastard son, and after being mocked in that fight, he became a laughingstock to everyone. The duel was the reason why his father stopped paying attention to him, too. Emily whispered and suggested that he should surrender. Young Cyan assured him that it's okay, and he just needed to win. In his head, Cyan took that as the maid looking down at him. Cyan sensed something. His weapon, a rapier, was heavy. He figured out his strength is the same when he was at that age. The sensation felt like it was not from a dream, nor a memory of his life flashing before his eyes. He had never heard of a magic spell that is capable of creating such strong illusions either. He wondered if he's really back in the past. Kranz commented how his brother didn't run off from the duel. Cyan thought that this could be his chance to change the future. He looked at his father, who declared the start of the match. Kranz attacked first while asking him where he's looking. Kranz was confident that he would hit him with his sword. Sion stood there and watched him. 
He thought how Kranz is like a snail. He shifted his stance, and that made Kranz surprised. Basically, Cyan just took a step to move on the side, and Kranz missed to hit him. This triggered Kranz. He commented how Cyan is dodging like a coward. But before Kranz could further do anything, Cyan hit his hand, and Kranz's sword flew. Then Cyan kicked him on the shin. Kranz was in pain. He fell to the ground and hugged his knees while groaning loudly. His mother yelled out his name in worry. Sian thought that now, if he just puts his sword on Kranz's throat, the duel will be over. He gripped his sword as he thought that wasn't enough. He recalled that when he was at that age, Kranz always bullies him as a form of entertainment. And that bullying continued in the academy, too. So Sion thought that he needed to really stomp him down so that he can never try to do anything like that to him again. Cien had decided that in that life, he will pave a path on his own for himself. Kranz got terrified. Tears were streaming down his face. Kranz was in pain. The result of the duel was that Kranz lost. The duke ordered Cien to see him and even freed up a schedule. That made Cien ponder if his victory in the duel was really that impressive. He even had a high-class knight, Elkin, who was directly affiliated with the Duke, escorting him. He met Margaret Ezret in the hallway. It looked like she talked to the Duke about her son. Cyan grinned when he saw that she looked like she stepped in shit. He asked her if Kranz is okay. She was furious. She told him that he was audacious to ask such a question after beating his brother like that. She told him that he was thick-skinned. She passed by her while saying that it's how duels are. Then he heard her say, this is why bastards shouldn't be treated like legitimate children. With a devilish grin, Margaret Ezret continued to say that, like mother, like son, and that his mother is a dirty whore. She told him that he should be on the streets begging for food instead. He was daring to put up a fight when he should have just known how to be grateful. Cyan looked back at her with a murderous intent. She had crossed the line. He pondered if he should just kill her, but he stopped himself. A grin flashed on his face. He knew better than anyone on how to make her suffer. He planned to torture her, slowly, like painstakingly slowly. He asked her if she's aware that he's going to the academy along with Kranz. She asked him what his point was. Then he said, I'm sure you want your son to graduate with limbs, right? I guess you're not that worried about him, huh, Duchess? This triggered her even more. She was about to slap him while calling him a vulgar piece of shit. Yolkin's arm protected Cyan. Yolkin apologized to the Duchess. He explained that the Duke called Cyan urgently, so they had to go. With a stern expression, he told the Duchess that they will get going. The Duchess remained silent. The Duke's orders are absolute. Cyan peeked from Yolkin's back and laughed. He was being protected by the guard knight who was given that order a knight who won't submit even to the duke's wife. He thought of how Yulkin is nice and reliable. The door opened and the duke told them to come in. Cyan entered the room. He greeted the duke. In his mind, he recalled that it has been almost 15 years since they had met one-on-one. -on -one. Duke Willius Vert is the great feudal lord of Velius, a western feud of the Ushif Empire. The world calls him by a different name, the guardian of the continent. He is the hero who stopped the invasion of demons for a long time. With the help of his remarkable magic power and otherworldly wisdom, that man shouldered a responsibility no one compelled on him until his very death in battle against the invasion of the Demon King's army. All he wanted was there to be peace in the entirety of the continent. But Cyan's memories of him are different. As a man who utilized his free will to decide on living his whole life serving others, for Cyan, he is a stupid man. The Duke commented how Cyan's eyes precisely followed the sword and dodged it. Cyan was confused. The Duke explained the scene when the moment Kranz ran at him, he looked straight at the path of the swinging sword and turned his body to dodge it. The Duke asked him when he learned how to wield a sword. Cyan thought that, as always, the Duke was sharp. He answered that he wouldn't say he learnt it. He revealed that he practiced every night on his own. The Duke pressed him for details, since the Duke knew that Sion never had any interest in swordsmanship. He asked Sion why he hid such excellent skills. 
Sion was embarrassed when he answered that he didn't want to catch others' attention, but the Duke was not convinced since, despite that reason, Sion went all out at taking down Kranz. The Duke continued to speak. He asked Sion if he also thinks that what he did after was unnecessary. The Duke was talking about Sion kicking Kranz on the ground. Sion thought that the intention of the Duke behind the question seems pretty perusing. He wondered if the Duke is trying to get a feel of what he's capable of. Cyan admitted that he wanted to prove himself. The Duke asked him what he wanted to prove. Sion confidently replied that he wanted to prove that he's better than Kranz, even though they share the same blood. He concluded that it was the meaning of the duel. The Duke laughed. The Duke praised him for his clear and concise answer that shows off his level-headedness. He didn't know Sion was so talented. He was delighted. The Duke told him that he will become a great and reliable support for Ashel one day. Sion then felt the betrayal from his past life. He was confused and disappointed. He wondered why he would become Ashel's helper. He thought how it was always the same. The Duke is still obsessed as ever with Ashel. His hand turned into a ball of fists. The Duke told him that he wanted to reward him, so if there's anything he wants, he should just tell him. With sharp eyes, Sion decided that he'll destroy everything. Everything that Ashel fucking tried to do. He told the Duke what he wanted. A few moments after that, Emily turned pale when she found out that Sion wanted to enter the battlefront. He told Emily that nothing is certain yet. Emily probed him if he's losing his mind, or if he has any idea what kind of place that is. She told him that it's swarming with wicked and terrifying demonic beasts all over the place. Velius, the western feud of the Ushif Empire. It is the only place in the entire continent to be called a battle front. Even in that, the Lima Valley, that can be called the front line, is a ferocious battlefield where the battles with demons have been going on for hundreds of years. Because of that, the Duke, who stubbornly opposed it from the start, gave Cyan a condition. He is to become worthy of going to Lima Valley within one month. He didn't know on what basis the Duke would decide his worth yet. He thought of raising his physical strength as much as possible in the given time. He's aware that he's still weaker than his peers, but he also appreciates that he's lucky enough to have the same combat sense as he had before, regressing, and the little amount of magic he sensed from within him. He knew that if he trained his body as per his capability, he could definitely make good use of it. He decided to start training right away. All of a sudden, his door busted open. A woman entered the room. It was Alice. This lady had this blue hair and stern look on her face. She grabbed him by the collar. Emily greeted Lady Alice. But Alice was rocking Cyan back and forth and asking him if he's gone mad. She heard that he asked their father to send him to the battlefront. Cyan turned pale when he asked Alice to let him go. She left him on the ground. Cyan's soul looked like it left his body. Alice commented that defeating Kranz got into Sion's head. She uttered that it won't. So she demanded that Sion go to the rooftop at once. At the rooftop. Alice briefed him. She told him that when they drew their swords, she would let him go to the battlefront if he could endure her attacks for three minutes. Our MC asked Alice if she really had to go that far. Alice was firm. She demanded him to answer one question. She inquired if Cyan is after the family's title. Internally, Cyan was surprised that she's going that far for that reason. He doesn't even have the slightest interest in that. Alice assumed that his silence means yes. She instructed him to draw his sword. Cyan was exasperated. It hasn't been half a day since his duel with Kranz. He concluded that his whole day was chaotic. Alice proceeds to attack him. He did not expect that, but he was able to block her attack, which surprised Alice because that would have been impossible for a 10-year-old. Cyan pondered if she really planned to go all out against her brother, who is seven years younger than her. Alice stepped back. She was processing what happened. A rapier has a very light blade, yet Cyan cleanly parried off her longsword's attack. She wondered if he'd just got lucky. She told him that he's got better intuition than she thought. He knew from Alice's expression that he's screwed. Alice went all out on her next attacks. She leapt to attack him, but Cyan was able to block her sword using his rapier. 
More than that, he was able to slide his sword well so that he was able to position it parallel to her throat. Alice was taken aback. Sion was struggling. He shifted his sword, but Alice blasted him away. He landed on top of the pillar. Breathing heavily, he thought how the situation could go wrong. Had he not twisted his sword midway through, he would have keeled her. Mist's swordsmanship skill, thick fog, mostly consists of skills meant to keel immediately. Sion admitted to himself that it's hard to fight without keeling because his strength is lacking. He wondered how much time was left. He's compensating for his weak strength by imbuing the sword with his mana, but he's almost at his limit. Alice was breathing heavily, too. She called the earth and wine to come to her and act as her sword. Cyan was surprised to witness the sixth star magic. Alice's blade glowed in blue. This is called the Aqua Blade. With a funny-looking crying expression, Cyan wondered if Alice was trying to keel him. Alice kept muttering that she can't lose. Cyan could tell by the look in her eyes that it would be the end of him. Since he's positioned on the edge, he anticipated that he'll fall even if he were to block her attack. He decided to trust that his plan will work. With an incredible speed, he charged at her first. He ran fast while Alice pointed her sword toward the sky to concentrate her power. Cyan gripped his sword as he begged. He's hoping somebody will come out. Alice is oozing with power. In his mind, Cyan hoped for Yulkin to show up. When Alice and Cyan were about to hit each other, Yulkin showed up in the middle while screaming, Stop! He blocked Alice's sword with his sword while he grabbed Cyan at the back of his neck. Alice's attack caused a huge explosion. Yulkin had a serious expression on his face when he called Lady Alice. He told her that she's being harsh against a much younger opponent. Cyan, still dangling from Yulkin's hand, let out a sigh of relief. He kept wondering when Elkin would appear. As if she came out of a trance, she gasped, and immediately she hugged her brother while apologizing. She admitted that she must have lost her mind for a second. Then she cried. Snot came out of her nose. She expressed how much she wanted to stop him from going to the battlefield. Cyan smiled and thought how it's very much Alice to do that. She always tries so hard with everything. Alice was the elite of the elites who got an S in all subjects. In the Royal Academy, where all the talented children gathered, whether they be talented in swordsmanship, magic, or other fields of study. On top of that, her beauty was astounding, so people called her God's child. From a young age, she was trained in swordsmanship. She was mentioned as being the future guardian of the continent, along with the oldest son, Ashel Vert. But not long after joining the Knights of Light, she was keeled. Cyan hugged her back while thinking of how much he missed her. His hug was so tight that it got Alice's attention. In his head, he vowed to protect her this time. Then she averted her attention to Ulken. She asked if he was the Duke's guardian knight. She was confused since the Duke just left for the war. Ulken informs her that he's carrying out the Duke's orders to protect the young master for a while, although he couldn't tell her because he's supposed to carry it out in secret. Cyan felt his presence ever since he left the Duke's office. He wondered if Yulkin would have not shown himself if he continued to not notice him. He wondered why his father would tell Yulkin to follow him secretly. All of a sudden, Cyan felt groggy. Alice caught him as he fell asleep. Alice smiled and commented that he's still a little kid. The next day, Alice returned to the academy. Apparently, she had come back just for a bit to see their father before her graduation. Sion felt the need to become stronger, so he had been focusing on strength training for the past two weeks. But ten push-ups is his limit. He felt like he hit the wall for the past two weeks. Back then, he was pretty confident in his strength. He knew this time. He needed a solution. Emily knocked on his door to inform him that a package from Emily had arrived. Sion got excited. Emily brought it out and complained how it smelled so disgusting. It's a hellhound's blood that he asked her to get for him. It's a rare item that can only be found in Lamia Valley. But now he figured out that the rumors that it was in the black market was true. The blood of demonic beasts is considered poisonous because of its sickening smell, as well as the feeling of burning upon consumption. But it actually permanently increases the mana and strength of the person who consumes it. 
Most people think that it was a false rumor, but Sion knew that it's true based on his past life experience. Emily asked him if he's really going to drink it. He answered yes. In his mind, Emily has nothing to worry about, since he's the only person who was able to adapt to her cooking skills. He chugged it down. He was reminded of the first time. He remembered it was mushroom soup. And after a single bite, his heart stopped for a moment. And compared to that soup, the blood is nothing. He finished everything and commented that it was good. The power is oozing from his body. He told Emily that he's going out for a walk. He wanted to see if it worked. Our MC stepped outside. He arrived at a mountain overlooking the duchy. It had been a while since he last came there. He had been waiting for it for the last two weeks. It was the time when Ilkin was not there for his regular reports. He usually visits the place when he wants to be alone. Then one day Ashel received a divine revelation from the god of light, Lumendel. It said that an ancient temple is hidden somewhere in the mountains. He didn't really fully believe it, but there was really a place where the flow of mana was concentrated. And of course, the divine revelation is yet to come. Only Sion knew about it at the moment. He touched the ground with his hand and his power traveled in the area. He grinned as he thought how Ashel had no idea what he's doing right now. The ground was shattered and it revealed an underground passage. He decided to go inside. He noticed that it was different from last time he was there. That place was an ancient temple that served the god of light, Lumendel, until all of the history on that land was erased. It was because of the god of demon war that happened 300 years ago. Who could have ever imagined that the place existed in the mountains just behind the castle? Ahead of him is a glowing sword on a pedestal. It is considered the owner of the temple. 9939. Before Foundation, August 12th. Humanity finally succeeds in driving out the Demon King's army from Velius. The Demon King's army was far stronger than the humans, but the humans found ancient relics called the gods' weaponry, allowing them to take the win. One of those relics, Duran D. Arc, was a holy sword blessed by the god of light, Lumendel. The sword was deemed the main cause of humanity's victory against the demons and Sion will meet his pitiful death in the future due to that sword, which will be possessed by Ashel Vert. He entertained the thought that perhaps Duran Dark had something to do with his regression. He touched the sword, and as he expected, nothing happened. He kicked the sword in frustration. He uttered that it ruined his mood. He mocked it, saying, holy sword my ass. He decided to take care of his business and then leave. Little did he know, the sword was also annoyed. Once he walks past the light, there's a shadow that feels otherworldly. Sian found it. At first glance, it looked like a sword shadow, but it was not a shadow. Where there is light, there must be darkness too. He imbued it with his power. It revealed a pathway that leads to another room, hidden by the altar of light. Our MC opened the door. He saw his sword glowing in red on top of the pedestal. He told his sword that it was nice to see it. Cyan grabbed his sword. It was the demonic sword, Karam. The same sword he was wielding before he died. The moment he touched it, it revealed a powerful ominous aura. He uttered, good morning, Karam. But there was no response, so he wondered if it's still not awake. Still, Cyan was elated. The familiar feeling to him was the best that it made him want to slay something right there and then and then a shadow with sharp eyes appeared on the ground. It asked Sion if he had no fear. Karam asked if he didn't know what it meant to have woken him up. Sion nonchalantly answered that he didn't know, and it could be that it meant the sword is his now. The shadow became bigger and intimidating. It informed Sion that since he woke up a demonic sword, it was too late to regret it now. The shadow grinned, and it revealed several pointy teeth. It rushed towards Sion while claiming that Sion's body will be owned by him. But Karam was surprised that Sion casually choked him. Sion told him that he wasn't that trashy before. The shadow started fading away and it revealed a human face. Karam wondered how Sion could touch him. As if an answer, Sion reiterated that the sword is his. Karam had pink, long, pointy nails. It attacked Sion with it while screaming, fuck off. Sion lost his grip and Karam leapt backwards. When Karam was fully revealed, 
It turned out she was a woman. She asked Cyan who he was. She can see a dark aura surrounding him. She asked if he was the successor. She inquired why she could feel Eru's aura from him. Cyan answered that she's right and that he is the successor of Eru. He wore a devilish grin and told her that her master is back. He demanded her to bow down. He called her demonic sword Karim. Karim denies him by saying that he's just a kid. She couldn't accept it. They fought each other. Cyan figured out that words weren't enough. The demonic sword's final goal is to take over the body of the user. That left him no choice. He planned to go easy on her. But then Cyan grinned and activated demonic sword control. All of a sudden, Karim was being pulled to the ground and the impact made her groan. Cyan told her that he will just say it once. He inquired as to why she won't accept him as her owner while he's still being nice. She grits her teeth as she asks him how he can use that power. He activated demonic sword control again, and that smashed her face to the ground. He did that over and over again. Her whole head is already buried deep in the ground. Cyan asked if she's ready to accept now. Karim replied that she accepted, yet she called him human. Cyan was about to activate demonic sword control again, but he stopped when Karim corrected herself and called him master, now that he had taken care of his business in that place. Cyan wondered if it's time for him to go back since he had been gone for too long. Karim, in the sword form, expressed that it's been so long since she breathed fresh air. She let out herself from the sword. She looked like a black balloon with eyes, mouth, and pink hair. She was happy to express that she found it refreshing. She asked for her master's name. Cien gave his full name. She commented that she had never heard that name before. Once again, she asked if Eru really chose a kid like him. Sion answered, yeah, in my past life. That confused Karim. Sion explained that he died once before. In her mind, Karim thought, what the hell? And then she noticed something. They were in front of the other sword. She commented how he's still sleeping. Cyan commented how the sword would have to wait for 20 years for his owner. Karim commented that Cyan talked as if he knew the future. He grabbed his sword and assumed stance. Out of the blue, he cut the handle of the sword in front of them. Karim was surprised. He asked him what he planned to do with it. He had a devilish grin on his face. He said that it could make things a bit more interesting in the future. The carriage can be seen moving away from the castle as the sun sets. It then slowed down until it stops. Cian is wearing a shield on his chest. He couldn't believe the day had already come. He thought about how time flies by. Cian greeted the Duke upon his arrival. The Duke told him that it will be the last time that he will ask him. He inquired if Cyan is still determined to go to the battlefront. He told Cyan that if he wanted to back out now, he wouldn't stop him. With confidence, Cyan announced that he's certain since his heart already lies at the battlefront. The Duke instructed Yulkin to open what he had. Yulkin is holding a scroll. Cyan recognized that it was a magic scroll. He wondered if they're summoning something. Yulkin released the magic scroll, and a creature with flames on its body appeared before them. This creature's paws have sharp claws. It was a hellhound, a low-rank demonic beast from the Lamea Valley. Cyan thought that his father and the knights must have had a hard time preparing for the test. The knights placed their hand on the sword. Cyan had observed that and thought how the knights are prepared to step in when it becomes dangerous. The duke told him that he's responsible for his actions. The duke urged him to prove how strong his resolve is by passing the trial and showing it to them. Yolkin thought about this trial. He tightened his grip on his sword. He recalled the time when Cyan invited him for a duel. That time, Cyan explained that there are only three days left until the deadline of his promise to his father. He thought that he couldn't just keep swinging his sword in the air. He told Yolkin that he wanted to have a sense of a real fight, too. So he asked him to help him out. Yolkin was hesitant, so he suggested for Cyan to duel with someone at his age, like the young master Kranz. Cyan explained that for some reason Kranz runs away whenever he sees him. In his head, Yolkin thought it was a hassle. Yolkin eventually agreed. He informed Cyan that he will only fight with his sword's sheath, 
and that he will only focus on defense, so he encourages Cyan to attack him all he wants. Cyan thanked Yulkin. He told him that he had another favor to ask. The atmosphere changed, and with a serious expression on his face, he told Yulkin that whatever happens in the duel, Yulkin should not tell the Duke about it. He emphasized that it was an order. That puzzled Ulkin. Sion attacked him. Ulkin was able to block it with his sword. But he felt that the attack was heavy. He can't believe that it came from a ten-year-old sword. Before he could get back to his stance, our MC attacked again. He also noticed how quick Sion moves, and he was surprised when suddenly he was out of sight. He wondered when Sion disappeared, and then he sensed him behind. He was able to defend right on time. Sion attacked him consecutively. He really took this duel seriously. Our MC gave his all when attacking. But all of it was deflected by Yulkin. He mentioned that as he thought he can't win against him yet. He thanked Yulkin for his hard work. Ulkin's breathing became shallow and fast. He praised the young master. In his mind, he can't believe that the weak young master Sion had grown that much. Back to the present time. Ulkin thought that his hunch was right. The young master could overcome the trial. The hellhound moved quickly. Sion anticipated its attack. It roared loudly as it approached him. Its eyes are focused on Sion. It passed by Sion. Sion understood that with his current strength, fighting a monster is still too much. He knew he had to end the battle as quickly as possible. The hellhound prepared to attack again, but Sion had planned to kill it with his next attack. He assumed a combat stance. And when the hellhound charged at him, he targeted its neck. He leapt high in the air and pierced its skull with his sword. The knights couldn't believe their eyes. The duke was pleased. Sion looked at the corpse of the hellhound. It was bleeding severely from its neck. He thought that it was a waste since that much blood could fill a few bottles. But if he did something like that right there, people would think that he's crazy. The duke clapped as he praised Sion for being impressive. He told Sion, then I'll see you at the battlefront. Sion thanked his father. Karim appeared as a small smoke in his shoulder. She fiercely asked him if she looked like a kitchen knife to him. Sion nonchalantly answered, of course not, you're a demonic sword. Why would you say that? Karim replied, then use me, damn it. She yelled that she needs blood to gain strength. She looked at the corpse and stuck her tongue out while begging to be allowed to have one gulp. Sian told her not to worry, and with murderous intent, he told her that soon he will use her to his heart's content. He told her to look forward to it. Karim complained that he should have just woken her up during that time then. After a while, an ogre appeared in the northwest. The duke commanded them to set up a line of defense and take down the ogre right away. He told everyone to leave no one alive. The knights yelled to start the restraint of salvation. A bright yellow mark in the air illuminated the area. A magic circle formed beneath the ogres. And restraints came out of that circle, immobilizing the ogres. The duke commanded the knights to attack. They sliced up the ogres in the area. The ogres roared loudly, but the knight bravely did their duty. They easily cut down the ogres. Meanwhile, Sion was mounted on a horse, watching them. While Emily behind him is scared to death, she cried rivers of tears as she asked the young master why he wanted to come into a place like that. Deep inside, Sion felt nostalgic. The duke asked him how it feels to be in the front lines. Sion admitted that he's a bit nervous. The duke told him that, as he had observed, he will never know when he will die in a place like that. He advised him not to ever let his guard down. He answered that he will keep that in mind. He knew that in the front lines, situations like that are a demi a dozen. There are usually three to four battles a day, and every battle has its own detailed response manual. With the capable knights as core, taking care of all the monsters that try to cross the front lines. At the base camp, he had observed that the ten that he was assigned to is in the rearmost area, where it's the safest. With the guards in the area being disciplined, he couldn't see a chance to feed Karim. He wondered if he had to wait until dinner time. He noticed Emily trembling under the blanket. She replied, didn't the Duke tell us? She continued, that we won't know when and where we would die. Sion asked, why won't she pack up and return? She yelled loudly, do you think I can, when you can't even do anything without me? 
With a slight hint of annoyance, she told him that with the monsters all over the place, if she ran away, who would take care of him? She instructed him to move since it's already time to eat. Cyan asked her about the cape that he requested. But Emily just left him in the tent without saying a word. Cyan was holding back his annoyance, but he wondered what would happen if he just chased her away. He couldn't believe that's how she treated her master. Later that night, Cyan lay a doll that looked like him in bed. He covered it in a blanket. It looked like he was sleeping on the bed. He thought that was enough cover. Emily asked him if he plans to exercise even in that place. He answered yes and asked if he woke her up. Her eyes are still closed as she praised him for being diligent. She added that the Duke would be proud of him if he were to find out. He put on his hood and told her that he will be leaving. He asked her to take care of things as usual. As he was about to leave the tent, he briefed her that he was asleep. Cyan knew that since they are in the front lines, the guard duties are strengthened. He ran as fast as he could. If he didn't take that chance, moving around freely will be difficult. He used his skill, thick fog, three move, fog's descent. He's relying on his memory and went to a place with tons of monsters. It was the perfect place to use KRM. KRM got excited over the strong scent of blood. She told his master that she doesn't think he can hold back. She urged him to move quickly so she could cut something down. Several hellhound monsters attacked them. Sian agreed with her and promised her that they would do as she pleased. Sian and Karam easily cut down the monsters. They were clearly enjoying this bloodbath. Sian activated Fog Sword, rushing Fog Storm, and he cut down several monsters while moving like a tornado. Few moments had passed. He stuck a tube in the monster's corpse. A mug waited at the end of the tube. He drains the blood through this method, and then he drank the fresh blood. He looked like a madman when he uttered, this is the stuff. Karam was elated too. She commented that it's the first time she felt so refreshed after waking up. Sion told her that they will keep training like that. She asked him how long he thought it would take for them to get stronger by killing those mutts. Little did they know, several hellhounds gathered behind them. He sensed the monsters. He assured Karam not to worry since the night is young, and there are plenty of monsters. Karam was getting excited. Ogres, hellhounds, giant crocodiles, you name it. That same night, a carriage escorted by several knights is traveling in the mountains. A girl with silver hair is inside the carriage. Someone can be heard saying that the front line is too dangerous. The woman inside the carriage with the girl suggested that they go back. The girl told her not to treat her like a child. She told her that she's the royal princess of the empire. With a hint of annoyance, she asked her how many times must she remind her that she's bound to her duty to assist her father in his tours. She warned her that she will get mad if he mentions it again. The woman replied that she understood. And then she changed the topic with the news saying that the youngest son of the Vert family is on the front lines. She added that he should be around the same age as her. The princess was surprised to hear that Duke Vert brought his youngest son. Her attendant told her that the Duke wasn't really planning to bring the kid. Yet the kid volunteered himself. Since they are at the same age, the attendant suggested that the princess and the kid should get along. The princess acted as if this didn't interest her. She ended the conversation by saying that she would go to sleep. The attendant respected her wish. After a few heartbeats, the princess asked for the kid's name. The attendant replied that it's Cyan Vert. She repeated the name and took a mental note of it. The face of the princess was then revealed. Waifu candidate number one was found. A monster was sliced to its death. The duke ordered to check if anyone's been injured. It was reported to the Duke that everyone is okay. The Duke praised them for their hard work and ordered everyone to go back. The Duke looked around. He had observed the one who killed the last flying monster, which is Sion. The Duke asked Sion how he was adjusting to the front lines. Sion respectfully answered that he's learning something new every day. It wasn't what the Duke expected since he thought Sion would want to hurry back. He commented that his son has endured for quite some time now, and he told him that he's proud of Cyan. That caught Cyan off guard. Before the Duke leaves, he told Cyan that he had something to talk to him about tomorrow, 
so he wanted him to come to his tent early in the morning. Sion was surprised, since he had never seen his father's kindness before. The night came, and it had an eerie atmosphere. A monster with a long body came out from underground. Fortunately, Sion was quick on his feet, so he escaped it. It was a death worm. It's gigantic with the end of its body full of sharp teeth. It usually appears deeper into the valley. Karim uttered that her master must be struggling, so she offered to take over instead. But Kayan wasn't foolish, since he's aware of her schemes. Karim denied that it was her intention. She promised to just use it for a bit, then she'll allow him to take over. The death worm's body had a bit of smoke on the rough surfaces. Kayaram pointed out that the death worm immediately regenerates any shallow injuries, so it would be useless to attack it. Cyan knew that she's right, and might have to continue forever at that rate. It had already been a month since Sion went to the front lines. He had drunk the blood of countless demonic beasts, but he felt that still wasn't enough. The death worm attacked him, and Sian thought he had no choice. He decided to play along with whatever Karam is planning for now. Karam got excited to go wild. She activated thick fog ninth form demonic sword manifestation. Karam decided to rip its thick skin. With just one swift movement from Karam, the death worm received several injuries on its body. The death worm bled. Next skill activated was the fog sword, eight fluttering petals. He moved really quick along the body of the death worm while slicing it. The death worm is losing its strength. Its blood showered the area until its body got severed into pieces. Meanwhile, the Duke's party investigated a corpse of a monster, and they noticed that it hasn't been long since it was killed. Yolkin noticed that the mana was quite imposing. He assumed that it could have been done by a demon. The Duke replied that they couldn't overlook it if there's a demon involved. He instructed everyone to inspect the area and burn the corpse immediately. The Duke inspected it closely since the traces of the sword looked familiar. He wondered if it was deja vu. Then he was called by Elkin to take a look at something. Yolkin raised his torch to light up the area. It was a corpse of a death worm. The Duke was surprised and curious on who would have slain a death worm like that. This is the same death worm that our MC had slain. He thought it might be the organization that he knew of. Demonic sword manifestation lets Karam took over Cyan's body so that she can use her true powers. But she can completely take over Cyan if he lets his guard down. Which is why Cyan thought that letting Karam take down just one monster is actually insane. He woke up feeling sore all over. He thought that it was a good thing that he drank all that demonic beast blood. Had it been a month ago, his body would have broken down. Karam suddenly uttered that she got everything now. Cyan couldn't follow what she said. She explained that it was just Cyan's outer appearance that's of a kid, but he doesn't act or talk like one. Karam noticed that the level at which he handled her is too proficient for a first-timer. In addition, he knew the entire geography of the Lamea Valley, too, and his sword techniques are that of mists, and it's as if he had trained it for thirty years at least. Plus, Cyan revealed that he already died once. That made Karam certain that he is a regressor. Cyan looked at her like she's a fool. He asked her if it wasn't implied when he told her that he had already died before. He thought he made it obvious enough. Karam was dumbfounded. Then she got mad and yelled how it was obvious when he hadn't explained shit. Cyan replied that he's too lazy for that. Karam changed the topic and commented that killing Cyan must have been hard. She had few theories on what happened to him. For example, he was killed by the owner of the Durandi Ark, and there's two possibilities. He was either killed in a duel or betrayed, and she had a strong inkling at the latter. Cyan asked why. She explained that he looked at the holy sword like he stepped on shit. She would have been an idiot if she couldn't tell from that. Then she concluded that Cyan's goal must have been revenge. She gave him some advice. That if she catches him faltering or losing, she's going to swallow him up. He smacked her head and reminded her to know her place since he's not an idiot. Karam was left dizzy on the ground. In his head, Cyan remarked that she hasn't changed at all. She was exactly the same as she was in his previous life. Cyan then left the tent. He looked around and wondered what was going on since it seemed chaotic. Emily greeted him in a hurry. He asked her if something happened. Emily reported that high-level monsters were found near the entrance of the valley. 
Cyan was slightly nervous as he thought that she might be talking about the death worm. Emily added that it had been so long since there was a sighting of a high-level monster near the camps. Cian asked if there's anything else that she knew. That got her confused. Then he asked if there was anything else such as sightings of a suspicious person or something about Cyan. But before Emily could answer, Oaken called the young master. He informed our MC that the Duke wanted to see him right away. Cyan was slightly nervous. He thought of the situation as a pain. Sian couldn't take care of the corpses last night because the soldiers suddenly appeared out of nowhere. He grits his teeth as he thought his plan of enjoying a quiet life before entering the academy would be ruined. He went to the Duke's tent and greeted him. He assumed that his father would notice that he was the one who killed the monsters. The Duke acknowledged his presence. Sian was worried that he'll be asked about yesterday's incident. The Duke asked him to take a seat. Cyan looked serious and nervous as he anticipated the dreadful conversation. He's thinking hard on what kind of excuse he would make. The Duke told him that he'll be direct. He straightforwardly asked Cayenne what he was doing last night. Cayenne replied that he went to bed early since he's tired. The Duke finds that suspicious, since the traces of the sword reminds him of Cyan's sword technique. The Duke started thinking that he was just overthinking it. Cyan inquired why the Duke asked him about that. The Duke was absorbed in his thoughts. He rationalized to himself that it's impossible for a child that's as young as Cyan to slay a death worm. Seeing that his father was distracted, he called his attention. His father assumed that he already knew about what happened last night. His father decided to look more into it, and he suspects that it was the doing of a secret organization, Mist. Our MC then pretended that this was the very first time he heard about Mist. The Duke then explained that Mist is an organization that has existed since ancient times. They do not know their goals, but they have assassinated countless nobles under the excuse of purification. They're infamous for leaving behind a black fog wherever they are. But one day, they disappeared. They were last seen a hundred years ago. But the corpse of the death worm from last night was shrouded in black fog. Black Fog is the trace left behind by Eru, the god of darkness, the very god worshipped by the mist and the source of their power. And the duke has this assumption that it was the mist that slayed the death worm and the other demonic beasts. Deep inside, Kyan was amazed by his father for being able to pinpoint who the culprit was, despite the organization having been last seen three centuries ago. The Duke admitted that they had no clue for the sudden appearance of the mist, so he advised Cyan to be careful. Nonetheless, the Duke planned to notify the Empire about this and investigate further. With that, Cyan assumed his father had believed. In his mind, the Duke thought that it made no sense for Cyan to be involved with such an organization when he's that young. The Duke concluded that topic. He went to ask Cyan if he knew who's visiting them today. Cyan replied that he heard that his majesty will be visiting, but he had no idea that it was today. The duke asked him a favor regarding that. Cyan was slightly nervous with the duke asking a favor. A few moments later, the horn blew followed by the announcement that his majesty, the emperor, had arrived. All the knights, including the duke, were on their knees as a sign of respect in greeting his majesty. The emperor excitedly called the duke by his first name. His majesty descended his horse. He lowered his knees and tapped the duke by his shoulder and told him not to be so polite since they're old friends. And the emperor saw Cayan. He was indifferent towards him. Cyan greeted his majesty and introduced himself. His majesty remarked that for a boy as young as Cayan to be residing in that kind of environment was proof that the duke's children are different from the ordinary ones. Cyan's goofy face appeared when he thought of the favor that the duke asked. He was scared at first, but it was just to appeal to himself as the duke's son. In his past life, Cyan was always cooped up in the mansion when the emperor visited. Now, Cyan was deeply touched by his father's trust. His majesty told them that he wanted to introduce someone as well. A young lady stepped out of the carriage. She introduced herself as the fifth princess of the Ushif Empire. Her name is Aaron Severus. Cyan recalled that she was the tragic fifth princess. A while ago, the Duke trusted Cayenne to escort Princess Aaron for the day. 
When the Duke told him that, he had no idea how. The Duke assured him not to worry about anything since all he has to do is to keep her company. The Duke described the princess as the same age as Cyan, and they'll be seeing each other more often when they enter the academy. Cyan recalled seeing her in his past life in between classes. The Duke told him that there's no harm in becoming acquainted with someone of the royal family. The Duke expressed that they want him to get along. Internally, Cyan really didn't want to do it, but he understood his father's intentions. The Duke probably wishes that they would develop a friendship like what the Duke has with the Emperor, but Cyan thought that the Duke picked the wrong person for it. Princess Arryn can't be his friend, although Cyan couldn't say anything since it's a future that is only known to him. He finds it annoying, but he decided to be obedient for now. He paid attention when Princess Arryn started talking. The princess asked why the river is red. Cyan confirmed if she was talking about the Blood River. Cyan explained that it was a stream that runs through the entirety of the Lamea Valley. There isn't any complex reason as to why the water is red. The demonic beasts, who are old or injured and can no longer fairly compete with others for survival, will instinctively jump into the Blood River. The demonic beasts' corpses and bodily fluid will then melt into the river, turning it red from the decomposition by the mana. The princess had a shocked, goofy expression after finding out that it's a river where all demonic beasts, bodily fluids, and corpses are. Cian nonchalantly added that the demonic beasts drink and wash in it. He told the princess that it's very disgusting, so he advised her not to go in it. The princess had a disgusted expression when she asked what was at the end of the river. Cyan replied that it's the demon realm. The princess was extremely shocked. She wanted to confirm if it's really the place where the demons live. Cyan decided to tease her. With a funny, devilish grin, he told her that if she keeps following the river, she might even meet the demon king. The princess was horrified. In his head, Cyan knew no sane person would do that but he finds it amusing to make fun of her. All of a sudden, a bright light appeared that caught all of their attention. The princess asked what it was. Sion explained that it was the third century post in the West. A yellow light signifies incoming demonic beasts. The princess was surprised to hear that there are demonic beasts in there. The duke immediately gave an order to protect the emperor. And the guardian knight division troops would go with him to the third sentry post in the west. The emperor told the duke, Don't be like that, Villiarth. The duke was confused. He asks the duke if he thinks he's there for a hike. He added that he's feeling bored, and to prove his point, the emperor unsheathed his sword. The duke signed and accepted the emperor's wishes. The emperor ordered his knights that they would join the demonic beast raid. He commanded them to focus on killing the demonic beasts until the raid was over. The duke ordered Sion to join too, which Sion immediately agreed to. The princess asked him if he could fight the demonic beasts. Sion answered yes and shared that he's still supporting from the back. He told the princess to get back to the shelter. Unexpectedly, the princess demanded to take her with him. In his head, Cyan wondered what the hell that kid was saying. The princess insisted that they're the same age so she can come too. With a bored expression, Cyan told her that people die in battle, and he emphasized that it's not a playground. The princess did not back down with her demand. Cyan was holding back his annoyance when he called Yulkin. Yulkin appeared and uttered that he will substitute the royal knights and escort her highness to safety in camps. Yulkin invited the princess to go. The princess looked at him as if she's intimidated. She pointed her fingers on Cyan and called him impudent for daring to treat her, a princess that way. Cyan got closer to her. His eyes are wide and his tone is firm when he told her that dozens of knights might die because of her stubbornness. He added that a split-second decision can decide her fate of either dying or surviving in a war. Being extremely intimidating, he asked her if she can take responsibility for all those lives. The princess became teary-eyed. When he was about to leave, he told her to go back if she's gonna cry like a child. The princess, Yulkin, and the maid were left standing there. The monsters were in the area, and it looked like a giant slime that gobbled up several humans.
The duke ordered them not to fall back. When they were close to the monster, he instructed everyone to halt, so they can get back to formation. Then he commanded for everyone to protect his majesty and slay all the monsters, and not spare even a single of them. In high spirits, everyone got moving. Dione Severus, the emperor of the Ushif Empire, had two wives. Diana Quizel was the first wife, but she is now dead. Cassandra Napellus is the second wife and considered the prominent judiciary of the empire. The former empress gave birth to the first and second princess, and the current empress gave birth to the third prince and fourth prince. However, Arin Severus, the fifth princess, was a bastardized daughter born to some peasant mistress. People treated her something like a scarecrow of a princess for her mixed blood, but she did not care about how others perceived her. She fulfilled her duty as a part of the royal family and devoted herself to her studies more than anyone. However, she was framed for treason by those who resented her, and she was kicked out of the royal family and the empire. Rumor spread that she died alone from a disease on an island. Because of that, people called her the tragic princess. She could have lived a happy life had she not been greedy. It would have been better for her to live without any ambition. Karim showed up and told Sion that it was what the Duke kept telling him about his past life. Sion explained that it's different, since what the princess encountered are royal politics. Lightning struck a monster. He watched several more lightning from a distance. Sion commented that the emperor is a skilled person. The emperor had the ability called Holy Lightning. Several lightnings struck the ground and killed the monsters. Emperor Diani is known to the public for being eight star in magic rank. Had he not become an emperor, he probably would have been the mage association's head. Sian had a funny expression on his face when he thought that an intermediate rank demonic beast is not a problem for the emperor. He also thought that being an emperor was just his hobby. After that short battle, an expensive liquor was served and the emperor commented that it had been a while since he shared a drink with his friend, Villiarth. But his majesty felt quite lonesome that he's the only one drinking. The duke apologized and explained that he doesn't drink when he's at the front lines. The emperor expressed that he was reminded when the duke asked him about the current atmosphere in the empire. He shared that there had been a recent spike in assassinations of nobles, and it's causing a lot of anxiety. The duke asked if there's any patterns in those assassinations. The emperor replied yes. All of the assassinated nobles were corrupt officials. Plus, Black Fog was present at all of the murder scenes. The emperor inquired if the duke had any idea. The duke shared that he found traces of them at the battlefront. It seemed like the mist followers have been on the move again. The emperor answered that it made sense, but he instructed the duke to look into it more. The emperor expressed that he appreciated the duke for taking care of the garbage, but he can't just sit by and watch as the people grow more anxious. The emperor shared that there's something else that concerns him. It was because some damn noble was blabbering that everything was the fifth princess's fault. The duke wanted to verify if the emperor meant that there were people trying to tie Princess Aaron to those incidents. The emperor shared that he suppressed them by shrugging it off as nonsense. But it seemed like there's a group that wants to use her. The emperor asked the duke for a favor as a friend and not as an emperor. He told him that if he ends up dying before the duke, he requested for the duke to take care of that child. Villarth Vert responded that he will carry out his majesty's orders to completion. The emperor thanked him. Later that day, rain started pouring down, and everyone was inside their tent, including Emily, who was confused if that was everything. Sian asked her what more she expected. Emily emphasized that it was a princess, and he left her just like that. Emily scolded him by commenting that he won't ever get married if that went on. In his mind, Sian thought that what he did wasn't even a date. He was about to leave and entrusted Emily to everything while he's gone. Emily asked if he's really going to train again when it's raining so hard. Cyan assured her that it's fine. Little did he know that there's someone standing outside his tent. Emily was surprised when she saw it. She asked who it was. This girl removed her hood and asked Cyan where he was going. It was Princess Aaron and she invited Cyan for a chat. 
if he was not busy. Emily was pumped up to see her highness. She looked like a fan girl. They went inside the tent. Outside, the royal knights guarded it. Princess Aaron inquired as to how long it had been since Cyan got there. He told her that it had been a month. He asked her why she came to see him. Princess Aaron hesitated to answer. She then asked if the maid can be excused for a while since she keeps staring with dopey eyes. Cyan asked her to go outside for a bit. Emily went out and her statement that they should have a good time together confused the two. Then she was fully gone. Funny enough, in his head, Cyan thought that it was a big no to have a good time with a ten-year-old. Princess Aaron blushed as she apologized for what happened earlier. She admitted that her actions were unbefitting of a princess. Cyan assured her not to worry about it. He apologized for being rude to her. She laughed and expressed that she would have said the same thing if she was in his place. She commented that Cyan is acknowledged by a lot of people unlike her, and he's a lot more mature. From her words, Cyan understood her personality. Princess Arryn asked if he's entering the academy too, and she was about to offer friendship, but before she could finish her sentence, Cyan cut her off with an apology. As he told her that he believes that he won't be any help to her. The princess was rattled to the core upon hearing that. Then Cian told her that if she's there to make friends, she should just leave. Princess Aaron told him that she wanted them to be on good terms and he's being harsh. Even with tears streaming down her face, she had a menacing aura as she asked him if he also thinks of her as a shell of a princess. Cyan remained silent. Then Princess backed off by saying that she understood that there's no benefit in being friends with her. Then she apologized for wasting his time. She expressed that she was short-sighted for thinking that they could at least talk. Then she told him that he's completely different from Sir Ashel. That struck a nerve in Sion. It evoked certain feelings in him. He grabbed her arm. Princess Arryn yelled, what's wrong with him? But Sion had murderous eyes as he inquired on how she knew his brother. She explained that she got to know him when she was touring the Royal Academy last year and he advised her not to care about what others think, and that she should just fulfill her role as a princess. In his mind, Cyan thought that as if it was advice. He knew that demonic bastard's personality better than anyone. Then he realized that it all had begun when his brother met Princess Aaron. He was pertaining to the plan to bring down Princess Aaron. Sion warned the princess, but their conversation got cut off with a loud noise. Immediately, Emily ran inside the tent. She told him to run, but the roof of the tent had already been broken, and then there was a loud impact from an attack. The knights cursed as they watched a gigantic ogre swing its bat-like weapon in the young master's tent. They hurried to check the condition of the young master. Emily saw the weapon that pierced the ground. Her tears fell as she was overwhelmed with worry. She loudly called out to the young master. The monster's features were then revealed. This one looked like a giant ogre. The scene then shifted towards this place where the emperor's voice was heard as he was surprised. They just received the report. Those advanced rank demonic beasts ambushed the rear camps of the border regions and the princess was there when it happened. The emperor immediately gave an order for everyone of the imperial army to head to the rear camps. Their priority is to secure the safety of the princess. The emperor wondered who she was going to see in the rear camp. Several ogres were there. Sion, our MC, was still alive. He watched them behind the debris. Death worms were in the mix, too. He, Emily, Princess, Aaron, and other knights were hiding behind a rock. Those monsters should only be in the deeper regions of the valley. But for them to be in the rear camp, Sion assumed that something must have changed. He wondered if it was because of him. Emily called his attention. She sobbed as she thought that he's really dead. That made her promise not to leave his side again. Earlier, the roof of the tent came crashing down. Cyan immediately ran towards the princess to protect her. Cyan thought how back in his day, he even killed the demon king, so as if he'd die now from a mere ogre. Princess Aaron was worried about the knights at the camp. Emily assured her that the knights are really strong. 
She held back her tears as she blamed herself now that the knights that came with her were in danger because she went to the rear camps. The knights assured her that they're okay, and it's a given that they would protect her as the knights of the empire. The other knights second demotion to assure the princess. Spoiler alert. These were this guy's last words. Cyan sensed something, and he immediately yelled for everyone to move. The knight was confused. He did not know that the ogre's hand was about to grab him. The hand squeezed the knight to the point that he coughed up blood. The owner of that hand is a gigantic, menacing ogre. The princess was horrified. Cyan immediately leapt in front of her and ordered her to get back. The ogre smiled. Cyan had confirmed his suspicion. The ogre is after him. He told them that he will distract them while they run away with the princess. Emily passionately replied, okay, and it was funny how it left Cyan dumbfounded. Emily grabbed the princess and she asked the knight why he was just standing there. It was comical how Cyan was slightly annoyed from this bitch's eagerness to leave. The ogre demanded Cyan's attention when it roared loudly. Our MC unsheathed his sword. He leapt high and slashed the ogre in its arm. This made Cyan wonder why the advanced rank demonic beasts are attracted to him. It felt like they smelled something from him. Karam laughed. She told him that he drank the blood of countless demonic beasts in order to become strong. And that's why he reeked of them. It would be weird if they didn't come after him. Cyan was surprised and slightly annoyed that Karam knew about it, and she only told him about it just now. Karam grinned at him and asked if he forgot that she wanted his body. Our MC grabbed her tightly and made her groan, and Cian assumed a combat stance. Karam asked what he was doing and requested for him to treat her better, to which Cyan replied, shut up. He stood in front of the ferocious ogre and uttered that he doesn't care, on how many monsters would come at him. He attacked while the ogre also did the same, but he was quick and he sliced its arm before it had the chance to hit him. It roared loudly because of the pain. And then he followed it with another attack. His attacks ended, and the ogre faced its defeat. Cyan sensed that there's no one watching now. So he decided to sip on some advanced rank demonic beast blood. Karam got excited over the feast that they'll have. But Cyan saw something that shocked him. A large purple claw landed on the edge of the cliff. It was from a devil dragon. The devil dragon roared loudly. Karam told him that it's still a baby and it must have smelled him. But Cyan didn't care why the dragon was there. He activated the demonic sword manifest. To him, what matters is catching that devil dragon. Now that Karam controls his body, he stated that she needs to catch that dragon, but he corrected himself and told her to eat it. Meanwhile, the other ogres faced the lightning of the emperor. The ogre fell and the emperor asked Villarth if that's the last ogre. The duke answered that it seems so but the emperor wasn't pleased. He asked about the princess and the duke's son. The duke apologized since he couldn't find any traces past the tent. The emperor told him that it's fine since he knew the duke is also worried for his son. The duke replied that there's no need to worry about him since what matters at that moment is the princess. The emperor had a funny expression on him that conveys that he was about to scold the duke, but he commented that the duke is being cold. The duke replied that Avert should know how to watch out for himself. A knight reported that they found the princess. The emperor asked him if he's really sure. Then the princess appeared. The emperor immediately called out her name. He grabbed her shoulder as he inquired if she's hurt. But Princess Aaron was in panic as she informed his father that they had to hurry and save him. The emperor asked who she was referring to. Princess Aaron cried as she told him it's Sion, and she blamed herself. Behind the emperor is the duke, who had a stiff posture. The emperor asked the princess to calm down and tell him what's going on. The duke approached Emily and inquired if he's Sion's maid. With a scary expression, the duke asked her if something happened to Sion. Emily trembled in fear. She had never seen the duke being that scary before. She stuttered as she explained that the young master acted as a bait in order to give them time to run away. The duke's brows furrowed. The knight informed them that he remembered where Sion's last location was. He told them that if they give him permission, he will go with the others to save the young master. 
The emperor asked Villayarth what he was waiting for. He told him to hurry. The duke looked menacing when he replied that they are not going to do that. Princess Arryn was surprised. The emperor asked if he was serious. The duke prioritized taking care of the situation first, because if the camps fall, the demonic beasts will invade the empire. He told them that they should reconstruct the place right away, and that is the only way to prevent more deaths. Emily's tears fell as she asked, what about the young master? The knight grits his teeth. The duke replied that Sian had done his duty by helping the princess evacuate, and that is what it's like to be avert. The emperor was sullen. Princess Aaron, too. She blamed herself. All of a sudden, they heard a loud monster cry. It went on, and they turned their attention up high, and they saw the dragon flying in the sky. Princess Aaron couldn't believe her eyes. There's a person on top of the dragon. Upon a closer look, Sion was holding on to the dragon's leg while it's flying. He looked funny as he grabbed it tightly while he silently cried about his situation. Dragons. Creatures that are the closest to the creator. They are very rare and noble creatures. Inferior beings like humans dare not easily approach them. Sion Vert thought about how it's an honor to be able to come across such a high and mighty creature but he questioned why it had to fly over the very people that he doesn't want to be seen by. It flew over Aaron. She yelled Sion's name. His majesty couldn't believe a dragon appeared. And on top of that, he questioned Villiarth on why his son is on top of a dragon. The emperor is in panic, but Villiarth just stands there. The emperor questioned him on what he was doing and if isn't going to save him. Sion internally cursed because all he wanted to do was drink its blood. He didn't expect that to happen. Earlier, the evil dragon appeared. He told Karim that she had to eat it. But a swarm of random monsters appeared before Cyan, who was possessed by Karim. Sion told them that he didn't have any time to waste. The fog soared. Rushing fog storm was activated. It sliced several monsters all at once. He landed on the ground, right in front of the dragon. He uttered that the dragon is definitely not a fully grown one. The dragon opened its mouth to release a laser beam. It was a big attack, and it shattered the ground on its way. Sian told the dragon that it was rude. For spitting on his face on their first meeting, he added that it can take his sword to face then. He slashed the dragon right at its eye. The cut bled and it made the dragon angry. Its sudden movement blasted Sian away, and then it chased after Sian. But that just made Sion, possessed by Karam, grinned. He had an attack on his sleeve, the eight fluttering petals. It caused a massive explosion that shattered the ground. But he admitted that he can't take on a dragon just yet because his shoulders became sore. He decided to wrap it up. The dragon flapped its wings in front of Sion, and it made a gust of wind. He told himself that he won't fall for the same trick twice. But he noticed something. It was a funny scene between them. The dragon scurried away from him while he's in shock that it happened. He called the dragon a lizard that's running away. He couldn't just let the dragon go, so he jumped so high to chase it. Which brings him to his current dilemma. Now he contemplated that maybe he used up all of his luck coming across the dragon. He looked down, as he wondered how he would take care of the situation. Karim asked him what was wrong since he's not doing anything. Cyan looked funny when annoyed, and he asked her if she can't see the people below them. Karim told him so what. She argued that if he unsheathed her, he's got to do something at least. He argued back if she's for real, of using a demonic sword with all those people watching. He told her that he'd be burned at the stake immediately if they saw that. She argued back if he's just going to stay on this dragon. He yelled that he's thinking right now. Their banter was funny. Villiarth had a magic circle underneath him. Our MC panicked as soon as he saw this because it was an advanced eight-star magic. Cian knows that his father is going to use the secret sword of heavens, knowing that his son will get swept up into it too. Several golden swords were released towards the dragon. In his head, Cian commented that his father is really living up to his title as the continent's guardian. The swords were reaching the dragon, but the dragon was able to evade it. Funnily, Cian cheered for the dragon. He was about to say to the dragon to keep avoiding like that until he saw one sword coming from the side, and he knew the dragon wouldn't be able to dodge that one. 
The dragon was hit and Xian fell. As he's falling down, he curses for missing the opportunity for such a special meal. Karam appeared and asked him what he planned to do, or if he's just going to kiss the ground. Xian replied that if he used a mist still, he'll be burned at the stake. She was furious when she asked if he's just going to let himself die. Cyan's reply was funny. He had a dead expression when he uttered that he doesn't know, and he'll just stop thinking. Until he sensed something. He told Karam that there's a way. Karam, with a horrified expression on her face, asked her master if he plans to fall in there. She described it as a shit-infested water. Cyan replied, What other choice do I have? Karam yelled loudly, No! And off they went. Someone sensed something. This person with two horns was surprised to see a devil dragon flying around that area. It was a rare sight. The man behind this person also has horns and replied that it was a young dragon. And it seemed like it got lost and got itself into trouble. The first man had silver hair and he commented that there must be some strong demonic beasts on the other side. But the other man replied that it's humans who live across that border. The first man was surprised to know that it was humans. And he added that it couldn't be true since there's no way a dragon lost to something like a human. And he remained silent. The man with red hair asked the man with silver hair if there's something bothering him. He replied that he's feeling a strange energy from over there. Something strange but also familiar. The man with red hair replied that if he's that concerned, he should go check it out. However, he must refrain from killing everything he sees just because he's bored. The man's wings appeared. He told the man with red hair that he won't cause any trouble. The red water showed bubbles, and Cyan emerged from it. He got out of the water. He felt exhausted. He groaned. His face doesn't look good. While feeling disgusted, he uttered, fuck my life. He asked Karam if she's still alive. Karam was annoyed. Her expression showed that she was clearly annoyed. She told him not to talk to her and that she's trying to decide how she's going to kill him. Cyan told her that they will clean up once they get back. He asked her not to be mad. That made Karam ask if he's going to go back. She told him to get it together and reminded him that they are in the demon realm. Karam assured her that there's now way they would come across a higher demon. But before he can finish his sentence, someone butts in. This person uttered that he was right. He knew something fun would be waiting for him there. Cyan had shivers all over his body. He knew that voice. The person, rather, a demon called out to Cyan. That voice is so deeply embedded in Cyan's brain, he couldn't forget it no matter what. Cyan now has a furious expression. The demon asked him if he's a human. It was none other than the demon king, Velcarion. In the past, all those who witnessed him said that it felt like looking at the embodiment of evil. And right now, that same hell of a monster was staring at our MC. He tried his best to not take his sight off the Demon King because he could kill him in an instant. That is what stands in front of him now. He cursed as he asked why now. The Demon King reiterated that he's asking if Sion is a human. He asked if he's not going to answer. Velcarion glared at him. The Demon King suddenly appeared behind him and asked if he wanted to fight. Sion was alarmed. He attempted to slash Velcarion. He managed to cut a strand of his hair which surprised the Demon King. And then, the Demon King, Velcarion laughed. He had a relaxed expression as he commented that he heard that humans are a kind with infinite potential. And he expressed that it might be true. Karam asked who that is. Cyan replied that it was a Demon King. That surprised Karam. She asked how the hell is he going to defeat the demon king in the state that he's in right now. Cyan knew it was impossible, and he could only try running away. His hands trembled. He wondered if he could survive against Velcarion. The demon king then told him to relax. He asked Cyan what he was going to do to a kid like him. He assured him that he can calm down. He laid leisurely on the ground to prove his point, that he's not going to do anything. He uttered that, even if he's an asshole, he won't fight kids. Cian made a funny expression because of the random action of the Demon King. Velcarion asked again if he's human. Cian replied yes. The Demon King inquired how he got there. He explained that it's because of the current of the water. The Demon King asked if it was his first time in the Demon Realm. 
The demon tried to tease him since he felt a strange aura from Cyan. He inquired who he was. Cyan, who's now sweating, replied that he's a normal human. The demon king replied that he's a normal human, but it felt like he knew the demon king. Cyan replied that they have never met before. The demon king replied that it's true since he had never seen a human before, so he wondered when Cyan could have seen him then. Cyan asked the demon king why he was there. In his head, he noted the relaxed manner of the demon king, and he wondered if he's the same demon king that he knew. The demon king explained that he felt a strange energy while making his rounds. Cyan inquired about making rounds. So, Velcarion elaborated that, as the demon king, it's given that he would watch over the lands he rules, but he stopped explaining mid-sentence. He sat down and asked Cyan what he just said. Cyan replied that he was explaining that it was a given for him to watch over the lands he rules as the demon king. And then Velcarion had a funny expression when he asked Cyan if he wasn't shocked since he said that he's the demon king. And that's when Cyan was caught. The demon king realized that he was right. Cyan knew him from somewhere. Because what kind of kid in the world would react like he did? Velcarion even asked if his mom never threatened him by saying that the demon king will take him away if he's not a good boy. Cyan thought that there's no way that is the same demon king that he knew of. He assumed that if things go like in his past, the demon's invasion should start soon, but he observed that the demon king in front of him doesn't seem like someone who would do that. So Cyan started thinking that if this is Velcarion's true self, then what triggered him to change? He asked Velcarion, if he really is a demon king, what is it that he wished to accomplish? The demon king smiled and commented that for Cyan to ask a demon such a question, he's quite bold, but he answered that he just wants his people to live good lives and eat well. Though the demon king expressed with all seriousness that if anyone dares to get in the way, he will kill them all, because that is his duty as the demon king. Sion felt shivers all over his body. He thought to himself that it was just for a moment, but he definitely felt it. The true monstrosity of the Velcarion he knew in his past life. Sion understood that it's repressed now, but some incident must have removed the chains on that side of the Demon King. He knew to himself that needed to prevent that incident from happening. He asked the Demon King if he wanted to make a deal with him. He told Velcarion that something will happen to him soon, something that will threaten the people he rules. Velcarion asked what he was talking about since Sion is not making any sense. Sion explained that he doesn't know the exact incident, but he's certain that the incident will trigger a great war between the humans and the demons. The demon king got up. Now he's agitated. He asked if Sion meant that he, the demon king, would want to take their lands in the future. Sion replied that it's exactly why he wants to negotiate. With a serious expression, Sion told Velcarion that he should promise to him that he won't start a war no matter what happens. The demon king told Sion that he's not making any sense, but he agreed that he won't start a war. He inquired what Sion would give him in return. Sion replied, I'll help you. Sion vowed that no matter what happens to the demon king, he will do his best to help him. The demon king loomed over him, but he did not back down. Instead, he met his gaze. Velcarion uttered that Sion knew something. Our MC was slightly intimidated. The demon king had a small laugh as he asked for the kid's name. He then introduced himself as Cyan Vert. Then the Demon King promised Cyan Vert that as the owner of the Demon Realm, he will not invade the human lands no matter what happens. Velcarion's wings had appeared. He flew in the sky, but before he went, he reminded Cyan to take responsibility for his own promise too. After all, a deal is a deal. Cyan met his gaze and nodded. The Demon King declared that their deal was sealed. After the deal with the Demon King, Sion was found on the shore by the knights. They uttered that it was a miracle. The inspection team found him conveniently lying there, and he was able to get back. Then he earned the nickname, The Boy Who Survived the Devil Dragon. They returned to an abbey in the borders of Velius, which was being used as a military hospital for the time being. Sion uttered, Sorry. Princess Arin was by his side, and she told him that she will repeat what she said. 
In his head, Cyan thought that everything was resolved. Princess Arryn was blushing when she asked him a question, and her question goes, Will you be mine? Cyan had no clue what she's saying. Cyan then nonchalantly declined her by saying, Nah. Princess Arryn was taken aback with his immediate response. She was about to cry as she states that of course he'll decline since she's a powerless princess. In his head, Cyan commented that she's really getting on his nerves. He knew that she was powerless. But to him, her attitude makes her even worse. It's obvious what's gonna happen. But he can't stop thinking about the fact that the piece of shit brother of his is somehow involved with her tragic end. Sion replied to her, You're right. He told her that she can't bring any benefit to her or anyone, for that matter, as she is right now. He added that she didn't have any influence or etiquette, and it would actually be bad for him if he were to be close to her. However, Sian told her that he will watch her from afar until she develops into someone better. Irene didn't expect that statement, so she wanted to confirm it once again. He replied yes and told her not to be disappointed. But Princess Arin blushed, and she understood that she just had to improve enough that he would acknowledge her. She pointed a finger at him and told him to wait and see since she doesn't know when, but she's going to become so powerful that he won't be able to ignore her. Sian told her that he's looking forward to it. In his head, he noticed how she cheered up real fast. Before she leaves, she has one more thing to say. She was blushing when she thanked him for being alive. This fucker had a deadpan expression. A few days later, at the rear camp's outskirts of the forest, a man is looking around. He was laughing silently as he held a box. The box glowed, and he uttered that there's not much left now. And then this man heard someone say, So it's you, Reynold Crimson. Reynolds' body can't move because it feels like there are invisible chains tying him down. The person had an ominous aura and approached him. What Reynold was holding was a small dimension box. This person commented that it's commercialization that has yet to happen. It's an artifact that's imbued with a dimensional realm and enough mana to allow infinite stone storage. It was the masterpiece of the Garum Kingdom's Mage Association. The person asked if he got that right. This person had been keeping an eye at Reynold for the whole year because it felt like someone within the Empire was smuggling them. So now this person has figured out the smuggling process. He took the box. He identified that the person is Reynold Crimson, seven-star mage knight, from the Garum Kingdom. Reynold knew the person before him. It was Cyan Vert. He asked Cyan why he was there. Cyan emptied out the container. There were monster body parts. Cyan told Reynold that he assumes that he extracted the blood of demonic corpses and brought them over in supply carriages that are allowed over the border. And he also assumed that there's a spy that helped Reynold in the supply department, too. He asked what Cyan was talking about. Then he announced that he doesn't know anything. Cyan told him that he doesn't need to play dumb. Cyan knew that the blood was already being sold on the black market. He assumed that Alice was able to get the hellhound blood through that guy, too. He started wondering who betrayed them. But either way, he can't allow Reynold to live. In his mind, Reynold doesn't have an idea how Cyan was able to capture him, but he can move a bit now. So he used magic on his hand. Reynold used breath fire and told Cyan to die. He told Cyan that the consequences of letting the guard down is death. And Reynold released a big flame. He uttered that he thought that he's dead. And now he was able to confirm that rumors about Cyan being true. He watched his flames engulf the area where Cyan stood earlier. Reynolds sighed and complained that he lost the dimension box. He never expected that kind of thing to happen in the midst of transport. Out of the blue, his hand was cut off. It became a fountain of blood, and he was surprised to see a black fog. Cyan stood before him. Reynold thought it was mist. Cyan grabbed his neck, and he made him choose. His first option is to tell Cian about the smuggling route and the spy, and then die a comfortable death. Or if he would rather suffer a death so tragic that even Satan would pray for him. A few hours later. At the Velia's western border trading post, people were busy carrying large boxes. Two men were happily looking at the contents of the boxes. They were glad that they will be able to take a bit more this time. 
The other man opened the other box while he wondered how much was in it, but the two men were in for a surprise. They recognized it. Inside the box is the head of Reynold. They wondered who did that. A man in a robe watched the busy area. It was Cyan, and Karam asked if he's not going to do anything about those guys. He replied that he would leave them be as he assumed that the warning had been enough. Garam Kingdom's seven-star mage knight Reynold Crimson. He's been smuggling the blood of demonic beasts from the front lines behind the Ushif Empire's back. The items Reynold smuggled were taken to the Garam Kingdom's Mage Association. The Garam Kingdom's Mage Association is a place where all the mages insanely obsessed with magic gather. They study the origin and foundation of magic as well as the art of creating new magic. They are an association that aspires to surpass the limits of humanity. Currently, they're making useful artifacts like the Dimension Box. But in the future, they will do all kinds of insane stuff with demonic beast blood. And Sion knew that he needed to put a stop to it. Karam told him that she thought he only plans to live for himself. But she was confused since he did a selfless act. He replied that he just doesn't like more people using the demonic beast blood. Meanwhile, at a residence in the Ushif Empire, Ashel looked out the window. He received a report that Sion Vert went on the front lines with their father. A naked woman on his bed heard the name and recognized that it was Ashel's half-brother. Ashel commented that Cyan is getting on his nerves, so he decided to go see him. The scene then shifted towards where these two luggages were placed on the side. Emily celebrated for finally being out of the front lines now. She was excited. She even commented that the academy will be incomparable to that gloomy place. While Cyan uttered that, it's the beginning of hell for me. The academy isn't the kind of place Emily is expecting. In reality, it's a place rife with politics and schemes. Envy and jealousy rule the place, and networking is prioritized over education. Emily excitedly expressed that she heard that there are lots of handsome instructors. She wondered if romance was finally coming to her life. That made Cyan wonder if she's really coming to the academy because of him. A few hours later, Sion's luggage was brought out of the carriage. He walked around. Then he heard a loud gasping sound. It was Kranz. He trembled at the sight of Sian. Our MC was about to greet him, but Kranz quickly ran away. That loser got PTSD from their last battle. Asked. Karam asked who that idiot was. Sion replied that it was Kranz, his half-brother, and she shouldn't mind him. Karam commented how Sian is an opposite of his family members. Sian replied that it's not really true. In his mind, the real opposite is someone else. He opened the door, and he was greeted by the servants. He was taken aback since the butler had never even glanced at him before. But now the butler is being polite as if his father or that bastard is in there. He thought of how much had changed over the course of the past year. He would like to think that it's the reward for his hard work. When he turned the doorknob, his mood suddenly shifted. He recognized the aura, the aura that makes him shudder. He tightened the grip on the doorknob. He already knew that beyond the door is that bastard. And I think we all know who this was. Ashel greeted our MC with a smiling face. On the other hand, Sion told himself to calm down. Ashel asked Sion if he doesn't remember him. Deep inside, his vision is starting to darken. He couldn't stay calm. Ashil told him that it would make sense since the last time they saw each other was before he went into the academy. Sion admitted that there's no chance he could calm down at that moment. He slowly took out Karam. He wanted to kill Ashil, but someone gripped his hand. It was Karam, and she told him to get it together if he doesn't want to die. She told him that there's no fun in killing Askel right now. That stopped Sion. He closed his eyes as he took a breath. And then he politely greets his older brother. Ashel replied that Sion remembers him. Sion replied that he could not forget his own older brother's face. He pats his head as he utters that it made him happy. He expressed that he's worried that Sion must have forgotten him, and now he's glad that Sion didn't. A shell expressed that he heard that Sion's swordsmanship had improved, and he uttered that Sion will soon be able to help father, but he corrected himself. This loser told Sion that he will be helping him on the battlefield. Sion 
with a murderous intent, replied that he's looking forward to it. Ashel observed him. Then he replied that he's glad. He admitted that he came there just to see Sion. In his head, Sian knew that Ashel is the kind of guy that does not spare a glance at those he deems useless. So, knowing that Ashel is there for a reason, is helping Sion calm down. Sian put on an act and told his brother that he missed him too. Meanwhile, Emily is complaining that Sian doesn't even have any baggage and he didn't even help her with hers. She stopped in front of a door to take a brief rest. And when she opened the door, she instantly started screaming at the young master for leaving her. But she was surprised to see that the first young master was there. Ashel told her that he heard that Emily was close to Sion, but it showed that she's even comfortable with him. He told her to feel free to do her work and not mind him. They saw him out of the door. Emily let out a breath and expressed that she was nervous. Then she told Sion that he should have let her know in advance that the first young master was there. Sion asked her to leave him alone for a bit. Emily was about to protest, but Sion was being scary. He told her not to make him repeat himself. Emily got worried. Sion vomited in the restroom. He was breathing heavily. He asked Karim why she stopped him. Karim suggested that he should be thanking her. He said that it was a good chance for her to take over his body. Karam told him not to be mistaken. She told him that she just wants his rage to grow because that way he'll be more delicious. That made Sion smile. He commented that it's as expected of Karam. Along the hallway, someone walked, and that person arrived at the front of the door. Ashel told this person to come. This man reported to Ashel that he tracked down the second young lady as ordered. Ashel asked where she was. The man reported that she's in the north, in the territory of the white elves, Fruina. He knew that Fruina is famous for hating outsiders. That made him comment that his sister is skilled with dealing with people. He asked the man to report to him when his sister was preparing to come back. The man asked Ashel if something good happened. Ashel asked the man what he thought. The man replied that Ashel looked brighter than usual. He inquired if meeting with the young master was amusing. Ashel replied that he could put it that way, but he told the man that he's wrong, and he admitted that he's in a terrible mood. The man apologized. Ashel recalled Sion's murderous eyes. He described that it was as if Sion was looking at his lifelong nemesis. He wondered if he just misunderstood it. He expressed that Sion is getting on his nerves and he'll have to keep an eye on him. The man assured Ashel that he's going to assign someone to do that. Ashel stared at the view outside his window. He once again recalled Cyan's eyes. He wondered what Cyan Vert was hiding. The day when Cyan needed to go has finally come. A carriage was already waiting outside the mansion. Several knights were also present. We then see Emily fuming in anger as she told her young master that she was disappointed in him. Cyan replied that it was not his fault that he can only take a knight escort to the academy. Turns out she was disappointed because she will not be able to go and accompany Cyan. She whined that her young master should have informed her beforehand. But since there's really nothing they could do now, our MC bid his goodbye. He even advised Emily to be good. And even if she was a little bit mad, this maid wished Cyan the best. Cyan had this smug look on his face as he told the carriage that they could go now. The carriage immediately started moving as soon as they heard Cyan's request. Emily was dumbfounded that her master would just leave like that. She then screamed at the top of her lungs that Cyan should not feel down even if he gets bullied. Emily waved goodbye while telling our MC to take care of himself. In his mind, that's very like her to say. He then recalled a certain memory when he was eight years old. Cyan was so sick with a fever that he was already repeatedly losing his consciousness. No one was there to take care of him, except for one person. This lady carried him on her back even if it was raining heavily outside and it was none other than Emily. She sprinted to the nearest doctor back then and didn't stop screaming for help. Luckily, one old man opened the door of his clinic and asked them to immediately come inside. Emily did her best just to make her young master feel better. Cyan knew that if it weren't for her, he probably would have been found dead somewhere in the mansion. For our MC, Emily is one of the people he cherishes the most. He then showed his bright smile at her while reminding her to act right, or she'll end up dead by his hand. Emily knew that this was her master's way of expressing himself. 
She then exclaimed that she was not able to hear the parting words of Sian. After that emotional farewell, Sian sat back up and had this satisfied look on his face. His expression changed as soon as he thought about someone. He can't really get why six whole intermediate nights were needed just to escort him towards the academy. Our MC let out a sigh. He smiled and thought that it seems like shit's gonna go down before he even gets to the academy. The day had almost passed by and the carriage was still moving. Two intermediate knights exchanged glances as if it was some kind of signal. Sion was lying inside the carriage when he noticed the stop. One knight approached and informed him that they will be camping in this place for tonight. Sian asked him where they are right now. The knight then told him that they were already in the central city, called Safern. He added that they will probably arrive in the city in the morning tomorrow. Sian agreed with this plan and told the knight to just inform him once they were done setting up. After that conversation, our MC finally confirmed that the knight lied to him. He knew that there isn't a forest like this near Saffern. On top of that, it's not somewhere nice and shady either. He thought that they were out in the middle of nowhere. He noted that it's obvious what these fuckers were trying to do. After a while, the knights informed Sion that he could come out now. Sion made small talk and told them that the air's really refreshing while checking the surroundings. The only weird thing was all of the knights had surrounded him. Their swords were also prepared to be unsheathed. Sion then asked them, Who's behind this? His question made them silent. Most of them were nervous. And as seconds passed by, it was evident that the knights became wary of Sion. But out of the six knights, only this fucker's expression was different. Sion saw that this one smiled. That annoyed him, and with a more intimidating expression, he repeated that he just asked them a question. The loser that smiled then prepared himself. He claimed that Sion doesn't really need to know anything as he will be dying soon anyway. He then approached our MC and told him that it's really a shame that they had to do this. He added that there are no personal feelings attached. While pointing his sword to Sion, he advised him to be nice enough so they will make it as painless as possible. All Sion needed to do was to stand there and keep his eyes closed. After that statement, this loser rushed towards Sion and attempted to swing his sword. He exclaimed, Goodbye! The blade was already about to touch our MC's neck. But he maintained his serious expression. In a split second, one head got slashed and flew in the air. But it was not Sion's. The knights were all shocked by what they just witnessed. It was the loser's head. Sian, while holding his demonic sword, spoke. I asked. Who the fuck is behind this? The remaining knights felt that the pressure around them just changed. They were now confused as to why they were feeling one certain emotion, and it was none other than fear. Sion's eyes were already glowing red, and questioned them why they were all not moving. He wondered if none of them expected this situation to happen. The knight that was at the back thought that he couldn't believe what he was seeing right now. Meanwhile, the others came to their senses and charged towards Sion, but their attempt was futile. This is a fucking fight that none of them could win. One by one, they screamed in pain as Karim continued to pierce their body. Sion then noticed one knight that tried to run, but the next thing this loser knew was that something hit him from the back. Our MC threw his demonic sword towards him like it was nothing. Bullseye. The only one that's left had his tears falling down his face. He can't even try to blink. As the bodies of the intermediate knights lay on the bloody ground, he wondered if Sion was really an eleven-year-old child. Our MC held out his hand, and that was for Karim to come back to him. The knight then thought that there's a reason why Sion came back alive after fighting a fucking dragon. While looking at Sion's menacing eyes, he knew that this mission was already doomed from the start. The last night couldn't stop his tears from falling, as he knew what was going to happen next. He fell on his butt as he was trying to get back while Sion slowly approached him. Our MC addressed the knight and commanded that he should tell him everything. And of course, his life is more important than a piece of information, so this one immediately revealed that Mrs. Margaret was behind all this. Sion had this disappointed look on his face as he thought that the interrogation was too easy. 
Meanwhile, the knight was still trembling from fear and was not able to speak a single word after that. The next day, we see the carriage is on the move again. Turns out the knight's life was spared and he continuously gave Cyan more information. Our MC chilled at the top of the carriage while finding out that Kranz apparently asked a favor to his mother. Cyan exuded his dark aura as soon as he found out that it was his loser stepbrother. He thought that he's gonna teach him a good lesson when he saw him again. His attention then shifted as the knight addressed Cyan. With a worried expression, he inquired what's going to happen to him now. Both of his eyes had a little bit of tears as he asked Cyan if he's going to kill him. Our MC then commented that the knight doesn't look that sad about it. The knight reasoned out that they were the first ones that tried to kill the young master first, so he has no right to resent him if Cyan kills him. To break the tension, Cyan casually advised the knight to just drive then. He noted that there's a difference between being useless and having no value in being alive. And that shocked the knight. He can't help himself but to thank Cyan. A few moments later, Cyan exclaimed that they were finally there. In front of him stood the grand central city, Saffern. In another place, a vase got shattered as a voice was heard asking what the hell did he mean. The person who cursed had a trembling hand as important information was being reported. The butler continued that one knight was missing and the other six were found dead. Apparently, Cyan left Saffern ten days ago. The one that was trembling was Mrs. Margaret, and now she blames the person in front of her for this unexpected problem. Mrs. Margaret continued to scream. She asked how they fail at getting rid of some little child. The butler quickly bowed his head and apologized. He admitted that they have underestimated the young master. He was already sweating heavily as he added that there must be someone behind the scenes that they don't know of. He also pleaded for Mrs. Margaret to give him one more chance and he'll send someone to the academy to finish the job. But the evil stepmother wasn't happy about this plan. If they do that, she worries that Cyan would do something to Kranz. She remembered the menacing look on our MC's face back when she pissed him off. She surely wants her son to graduate from the academy in one piece. Mrs. Margaret turned her back and told the butler to not do anything. And her order was quickly understood. But before he leaves, she reminds him that no one must know about their conversation and what happened to Cyan. She was clear in her statement that they should eliminate anyone who knows about it. The butler left the room and closed the door. Little did he know, someone was watching him at the other side of the hallway. Back to our MC, he was taking a short nap. It has been ten days since they left the city of Saffron. The knight that was spared, whose name was Brian, has been acting as his subordinate all this time. Cyan assumed that Mrs. Margaret already knew that he was still alive, and at this rate he'll be arriving at the Royal Academy safely. The only problem was he still needs to think about what he should do with Brian. This guy then informed the young master that they had arrived. Cyan replied, All right, all right. He had an annoyed expression as he thought that this brings back the old days. And that was because he's now back inside the Royal Academy. His carriage reached the fate of the place, and he thought that he can't really call them good memories, but the Academy changed him in many ways. As soon as he entered the building, our MC showed his emblem, and he introduced himself as Sion Vert of the Duke Vert family. The ones that were assigned onboarding of the students looked stunned upon seeing him. This lady came to her senses, and she immediately accommodated Sion. She noted that he was definitely registered and added that he just needs to go to the assigned dormitory and wait. The entrance ceremony and the elemental test is in two days. This information got Sion into thinking if he heard something right. The lady then gave him the key to his room and it apparently came with a letter. Sion was startled as soon as he saw it. He asked if she was sure that she hadn't made a mistake. A few moments after that, bags were dropped on the floor. Brian had his mouth wide open as he addressed his young master. Turns out the room that was given to Cyan was the Royal Hall. It's a luxurious room that cannot be compared to any dormitory inside the academy. Cyan noted that no one in their family received this kind of treatment and thought that someone had to be behind this. Cyan broke Brian's amazement as he questioned if all the luggage were there. Brian nervously confirmed it. And since all of his belongings were now in his room, Cyan tried to get something inside his coat's inner pocket. 
With a serious look on his eyes, he told Brian that his role is done. Brian panicked and tried to ask Cyan to wait a second. He thought that our MC would kill him. But to his surprise, he caught a bag of gold coins. Brian was dumbfounded as he asked Sion, what's with the money? Sion continued walking while telling Brian that it was his payment for his hard work for the past few days. The money should also be enough for him to start a new life wherever he goes as he might end up dead if he goes back to Velius. His statement made Brian speechless. All of a sudden, he kneeled and exclaimed something that caught the attention of Sion. Brian Kendrick, an official knight of Velius, asked our MC's permission so he could serve him his entire life. The hyped atmosphere that his pledge should have filled the room vanished as Cyan was shocked to find out that Brian was a knight. He couldn't believe it. Brian then revealed that he's the lowest of the low, so he was often treated as a coachman. While still bowing his head, he narrated that his father used to tell him that if he meets someone that he can trust and serve all his life, he should ask him without any hesitation. Sean sighed as he commented, that's a really foolish thing to do. Brian was caught off guard by our MC's answer. While giving off his dark aura, he asked Brian how he can be sure that Sian would never stab his back in the future. Brian immediately answered that it doesn't matter if the young master would take his life in the future. He was then cut off as Sian tapped his shoulder while telling him to never think about betraying him. That was our MC's way of accepting him as his knight. Cyan then opened the door while telling Brian that they will not attend the entrance ceremony and just go to the elemental test. Brian still can't believe what just happened. Meanwhile, inside the Royal Academy Dean's office, two people were talking about the talented students at the elemental test this year. The testing hall was filled with a lot of aspiring students, and currently, one student with silver hair stood at the center of a platform. Bright light enveloped her surroundings. The one that was taking the elemental test was none other than Princess Aaron. As for her evaluation, her mana rank is at two stars, physical rank is at B rank, and her element is light at 52%. The next student that took the test was this guy with huge muscles. His name is Seth Chaharkin. His mana rank is at three stars, physical rank is at A rank, and his element is sand at 71%. One old man continued to browse the information of the students this year. The previous students were already remarkable, but someone caught his attention. It was Cyan. Our MC took the test, and his mana rank is only at one star. Physical rank is at S rank. And the most notable part was his dark element. It was at 92% proficiency. This female instructor, named Sarika Nigrithi, noted that even Alice Vert, who was titled as the God's Child, was only at 88% in water element by the time she graduated. The old man found this information interesting. Even Alice, who was praised for possessing top-notch talents, could not match up to her younger brother. This old man was the Royal Academy Dean, Kundal Quizel. The only thing that Professor Serica was concerned about was Cyan's element is dark. Dean Kundal admitted that his talent might just rot. However, they still cannot ignore his growth and talent potential. Dean Kundal then inquired if the professor was aware that Cyan was assigned to the Royal Hall. Professor Sarika said yes, as she heard it from the other instructors. She had this shocked expression as she heard the dean reveal that it was as per the emperor's order. The dean shared that, apparently, Cyan saved the young princess from the monsters in the front lines. The emperor was even considering marrying the two. They then imagined the fifth princess, who was considered to be a failure, marrying someone from the Verts family who was known to raise talented individuals. They wondered what kind of consequences would that situation have. Sarika commented that conflicts over the succession will be heightened, and the empire might split up and cause a civil war. But then Dean Kundal stopped her from overthinking. He told her that all they could do for now was to watch. They need to wait, whether Cyan will become the empire's hero or if he will be responsible for its downfall. Meanwhile, the culprit behind the overthinking of the adults was just casually walking down the hallway. Sion noted that in his past life, his dark affinity was just at 80%. He wondered if it was because he drank the demonic beast's blood. His attention then shifted as he saw the person in front of him. Sion said hi. 
The blonde guy was Kranz, and he quickly panicked. He was not expecting Sian to still be alive. The chubby guy that was beside him showed an opposite reaction. The chubby guy asked Kranz if this was the kid that he treated like his slave. Kranz was hesitant to answer yes, but he still did it. This loser is Garum Kingdom's Marky Panarin's son, Popper Panarin. Popper teased Cyan that he didn't even know who his mom was. In our MC's past life, these two used to bully him whenever they had the time. But this time, it will surely be different. Cyan thought that it must be his lucky day to come across these losers. Popper tapped Kranz's shoulder as he noted that it seems that Cyan needs a good beating. Kranz tried to stop him. And on the other side, our MC looked like he was planning something. Kranz wanted to flee and suggest that they should just go to the cafeteria, but this fatso continued walking towards Cyan, and all of a sudden, a powerful kick was sent to Popper. The impact was so powerful that it shattered the wall. Cyan had this devilish grin. I bet it really felt satisfying as he finally got his revenge. Kranz could only cry while screaming for Popper's name. Fatso Popper got popped. Now that Popper was unconscious, Cyan spoke and told Kranz that they really should have a chat. This loser was already sweating heavily and crying as our MC's hand landed on his shoulder. Cian leaned closer to him and whispered that he really doesn't care what he does behind his back. But if he ever sees him again, something will happen. While grinning, Cyan told his stepbrother that he will be graduating in a wheelchair. That statement was more than enough to make the tears fall from Kranz's eyes. The loser's knees felt weak because of the fear that he felt. Meanwhile, Sion casually walked away while thinking that his life in the academy is going to be fun. A few hours later, inside the academy's library, instructor Sarika Nigrithi walked through the hallway. She is the same professor that we met last time. She was still thinking about the dean's statement about Sion being the hero or the downfall of the empire, and that made her plan to keep a close eye on our MC. Instructor Sarika continued her stay inside, and that was because she was about to get a specific book. But upon seeing the spot, it was missing. Her mood suddenly changed as soon as she realized that it was not there. All of a sudden, she heard a voice asking if she was looking for a book. She was startled. The one that spoke was none other than Cyan. Instructor Sarika immediately changed her attitude and smiled. She then asked Cyan how he got in there as students were not allowed in this place. But in her mind, she noted that she didn't even detect Cyan's presence. Instructor Sarika tried to confirm if he was really Mr. Cyan Vert. She also asked if our MC could give the book to her as she really needs it for her research. Xian smiled and told her, of course. He handed her the book and the instructor thanked him. But all of a sudden, a dark, ominous aura was about to hit Sian. The book that he was about to hand to her was cut in half. Sian then awkwardly maintained his distance towards Sarika. He asked if that was not the book that she was looking for. He was also about to address her as Instructor Sarika, but he stopped. He corrected himself and revealed that this lady in front of him is the assassin organization Mist's Hallmaster, Sarika Nigridi. With an intimidating gaze, Sarika asked Sion, how the hell did he know that? Our MC then recalled that in his past life, he thought of this instructor as someone who was ordinary. She even approached Sion back then and asked, how's his life in the academy? The bullied Sion maintained his silence and didn't answer her question. Instructor Sarika was apparently in charge of Sion's counseling, and she used this to get to know him more. Sion's eyes were already filled with emptiness when he heard that Sarika sees a lot of potential in him. And of course, he thought that it was a joke because all he did was to be bullied by his own brother. But his expression changed as the instructor told him that she was very interested in him. She noted that it's rare to see someone with 84% in the dark element. Sian blushed a little while replying that someone told him that it's not a special element. Serica happily informed him that that was the case because humanity doesn't know much about it. 
but she actually thinks that his growth potential is infinite. Cyan got more interested upon hearing those words. He even got swept up in confusion. With a lovely and innocent smile, Instructor Sarika told Cyan that she looked forward to working with him. Those words made our MC think that this person could help him. Back to the present time, Cyan noted that those damn smiles were all just part of his misunderstanding. Him being a simp back then didn't help him because he didn't notice that he was already being deceived. This hot waifu right here used her job as a professor to hide her true identity. Cyan noted that he will not be falling again with her innocent looks because this lady right here is a fucking assassin. On top of that, she's the hallmaster of the assassin organization Mist, and her goal was to hide and gather information inside the academy where all the royals and nobles of the continent come to learn. Our MC lowered his guard as Sarika broke the silence. She told him that she will hear him out in her lab so he should come with her. This lady had also removed her glasses, and goddamn, she looked fine. That left our MC dumbfounded. He thought that she didn't really react as dramatically as he had expected. A few moments later, they were now inside Sarika's lab. Sion noted that this place hasn't changed. Mysterious scrolls and daggers were placed around. Our MC sipped his tea. He then smiled and sarcastically told Sarika that she had put poison in the tea and that gave Sion the reminder to never trust this bitch. Serika laughed. She replied that Sian does not need to worry because it's not a very severe poison. It will only melt his organs. Little did she know, this trick would not work on Sion. He was confident because he had consumed countless demonic beasts' blood and Emily's food. His expression turned more serious while advising her to maybe use something a bit stronger next time. That gave Serika the hint that they should now start their real conversation. She started it by asking Sion how he knew her true identity. She also inquired how our MC knew that she received her orders in that specific unpopular book in the library. He was even aware of the exact location, too. With an interesting look on her face, she concluded that maybe Sion was also a part of Mist. Sian had this funny look as he asked her what more proof she needed. This got Serika thrilled. She exuded her dark aura and told Sian that his head got big because of his elemental test. But Sian ignored her remark and changed the topic. He shared to her that before going into the academy, he was asked by everyone if just one escort knight would guard him. That gave Serika a confused look on her face. Sian then continued to tell her that it was because nobles have been murdered left and right recently. He turned his gaze to Sarika and asked her when the purification project began. Sarika repeated his words and got confused about the purification project. While trying to deny that she knows nothing about what Sian was talking about, this bitch was already oozing with her dark aura. And our Gigachad MC countered this while also exuding his aura. He clarified himself that he was referring about the fucking assassinations. Serika grinned while warning Sion that he might regret what he just said. But he didn't back down as he asked if she was really threatening a student right now. All of a sudden, her foot moved. Serika kicked the whole table towards Sion. Sion was already prepared with this and was about to punch the table. He also asked if this was really how Serika would respond to his questions. Sion's punch broke the table in half, but that was just a diversion for this lady to bring out her weapons and position herself on top of Sion. Our MC was aware of her move and thought that he proved his identity enough. Sarika was about to attack him because even though Sion claims that he's part of Mist, she didn't even know his name. She claimed that as the hallmaster, she knew all of the members. She landed on the ground and released slashes. Sian created some distance between them. Sarika then dashed towards him while screaming that she won't let him go that easily. Sian sighed while saying that she had given him no other choice as he summoned his weapon. Sarika's attack was deflected by Sian and that caught her off guard. Sian claimed that if she doesn't believe him, he will just show her. Multiple slashes were then sent towards Sarika, and she was not able to react. 
Sian's last attack sent her backwards. Serika's eyes widened as she noticed the dagger that Sian was wielding. She knew that this was none other than the demonic sword, Karam, that only the one chosen by Eru can wield. Our Giga Chad MC had this cool pose as he asked her once again if she believes him now. Sion also knows that Mist is looking for a successor right now, and that statement froze Serica as she wondered how the hell did he know about that. Sion then claimed that the very person that they have been searching for is fucking right in front of her. He commanded Serica to bring him to Eru right away. Later that day, the night came. The scene shifted towards this street somewhere in Lewin, where there's almost no people walking around. An old house came into view, and at its door, someone was busy chanting a magic spell to pick up the locks. A purple magic circle appeared. A few seconds later, the door finally opened. The ones that were beside the action was none other than Sarika and Sion. Both of them concealed their identities by wearing their dark cloaks, Serika broke the silence as she told Cian that he was not even surprised that there's a mist base at a place like this. She added that this is the path to the altar that Cian wanted to go to. From this point on, he will be on his own. Dark ominous aura was also coming out from it. Cian entered the house alone. He thought that this is really a unique realm made with the power of the god of fog. And because of that, the place is much bigger than what it looks from the outside. It was like a whole new place. But even if Cyan was impressed, he didn't lower his guard. He still noticed the presence of those who were hiding in his sight. Two people at four o'clock, and another three assassins at eleven o'clock. And just like that, daggers came flying towards Sion. But since he already predicted this, he easily deflected them all. The assassins then started their ambush. Two of them appeared behind Sion. He thought that this welcome ceremony was a bit too much even for him. Our MC jumped backwards to dodge their attacks. Sion leaped once again, and this time he counterattacked. He threw his daggers towards the assassins. Most of them were not fast enough to even react. Except for one. The mysterious assassin replicated the same movement that Cyan used when he deflected the daggers earlier. Cyan immediately noted what just happened. He couldn't believe that one of them managed to react in that short moment. The assassin's eyes widened as he thought that this fight was amazing. He then signaled for them to do a secret technique expansion. The mist assassins regrouped and did the death horn formation. Cyan was already being surrounded. And to counter this, he exuded his dark red aura while also chanting a secret technique expansion. He raised his hand and gathered his power. The assassins were startled as they saw his technique. They hesitated for a bit, but one of them told everyone that a kid like Sion wouldn't be able to perform such a technique. The one they were talking about was the bloodthirst wave. Sion let out a violent force that quickly made its way all over the place. Bloodthirst Wave is a secret technique exclusive to assassins that allows them to manifest bloodthirst into a physical form to attack others. And upon being hit by the bloodthirst, the assassins were immobilized. Most of them couldn't even breathe. A few moments later, most of the assassins were down. Cyan looked at them and noted that they won't be able to get up for a while now. He still gave them mercy as he didn't kill them. But then something caught his attention. The same assassin that deflected his dagger is still standing. That gave him the idea that maybe this one is one of the higher-ups. Sion knew uh, that he can't really waste any more time with this, so he started to get serious. He activated one of his fog sword skills. He raised one of his arms while summoning his demonic sword on the other one. This move is called Unshakable Roots of a Great Tree. The mist assassin then made his way towards Cyan. Our MC was caught off guard as the assassin forced him to clash their weapons. Cyan wondered who the hell was this guy, as he just managed to stop his technique midway through. No ordinary member of the mist assassins could do that. The mask of the assassin then fell on the ground. And at the same time, he finally spoke. He praised Cyan for being adept at his main skill. As their weapons were still touching each other, the assassin's face was revealed. 
The assassin exclaimed that he couldn't hold back any longer. Sion had this funny expression on his face as he realized who the assassin was. The assassin is a freaking lady. It was none other than Sarika. This bitch lied to Sion earlier. She hid her presence so she could fight him and see his true powers. And just to make her back away, Sion performed a series of deadly slashes called Thick Fog Eighth Form Assault. The atmosphere around the area just became more intense. Sarika had this creepy smile as she commented that Sian was proficient with the thick fog and the fog sword techniques, and that made her more interested in him. Sarika was just about to tell him to show her his true potential, but then Sian did something unexpected. He ran on the opposite side, and that was because this lady was known to be a zeal for combat. Her great energy or enthusiasm in fighting strong opponents drives her crazy. Cyan thought that the drunken desire of the Hallmaster would really become dangerous if their fight continued. He then ran for his life. Cyan knew that she would want to fight until one of them dies, and only those who have experienced this would know that kind of feeling. Serika was already dashing from wall to wall just to chase our MC, she had this crazed facial expression as she exclaimed for Cyan to come back. She even told him that she was just giving him what he wanted from the start. And to stop him from getting away further, she used the technique called Fog Sword, Rushing Fog Storm. She performed a series of slashes until she hit Cyan. Cyan backed away as he thought that even though he also wanted to fight stronger opponents, He's not as perverted as Serika. Serika, on the other hand, was still teasing him to fight her. She commented that this realm was created by Eru. The outside world won't detect his energy at all, so he doesn't need to worry about that. And that statement made Cyan become more serious. In his head, he finally agreed. After all, he can use all the techniques he wants in a place like this. Cyan knew that he could end up killing this thick instructor, but that really doesn't concern him anymore. He summoned his demonic sword and positioned himself for their battle. But before he could dash and start their fight, his body trembled. Cyan suddenly fell face down on the ground. That also caught Sarika off guard. An ominous female voice was then heard along the area. She uttered, I knew it. You can rest. Sarika's eyes widened as she saw the owner of the voice. It was none other than our OG demonic sword waifu, Karam. She has finally manifested in her true form. She told Sarika that she didn't really want to intervene, but Sarika forced her to. The perverted instructor then acknowledged the demonic sword and quickly kneeled in front of her. Karam asked her what's up with this situation. Karam knew that Sarika worships Eru, but she's still here attacking her master. This lady then answered that she's just checking to make sure that Cyan is who he claimed he was, whether he really is the successor or not. That answer angered Karam. She released her dark aura while telling Serika that she could have just called for her god instead. That's a much easier way to solve things. And since it had already come to this point, Karam wondered if Sarika would want her to take this as a direct challenge towards the demonic sword. The pressure of the whole area suddenly felt a lot heavy. But instead of being intimidated and scared, Sarika just scoffed. She told Karam that before that, they should pay attention to the successor first. That confused Karam. She then turned her gaze to our MC, who was already losing a lot of blood. Karam panicked while asking Cyan why he was just lying there and dying. Sarika explained that it was because Karam manifested into her whole form, but that is a very inefficient way of doing it. And as a result, it eats away the owner's life force. Karam grabbed Sian's collar while telling him that this should be nothing. She was even mad because her master was still weak, even after drinking all that beast blood. Their funny interaction was cut off as Serika butted in again. She uttered, I, Hall Master Serika Nigrithi of Mist, do not reject any fights. She even licked her lips while telling Karam that if she was her opponent, she really can't turn it down. The once shy and innocent instructor has really become a perverted one. 
Karam has started to feel weird about Sarika. She wondered what the hell was wrong with her. It even scared her. Meanwhile, Sian has finally regained his consciousness. While still regaining his composure, he asked Karam why she suddenly manifested. But instead of answering her master, Karam told him that he just needs to stay behind her while she teaches Serika a lesson she will not forget. And since this one had been longing for a powerful opponent, she exclaimed that it would really be an honor to fight her. Karam was becoming more annoyed, so she warned her not to cry and beg for her forgiveness later. Sarika was quick to answer that she would love it more if Karam could push her to that point. These two bitches were about to start their fight, but a voice stopped them. That's enough! A dark blue portal has started to appear. This also caught Sion's attention. He knew that the portal was the one that he had been waiting for. The voice told Sirika to send the successor to the altar. She kneeled and acknowledged the command. Our MC had this awkward smile, and that was because he could now finally get to meet Eru, the god of darkness. That's all the time we have for today. If you want to watch the next part, please like and subscribe. Thank you, and see you on to the next one.